live in five. I want to start with uh, Excuse me, I uh, also have a book. It's not out yet. I actually just started writing it, but I do have a cover, so I put it on another book. So here's what it's going to look like. It's called They Call Me Nigger. One family struggle for justice and freedom. And it's written by me and about me and it's very inspirational. So when it comes out, remember that you saw this and about it. I don't know what I'm charged for yet. They don't. The game statistic. Complain to someone who gives a fuck. And Croft is back, huh? once again taking on the role of Tomb Raider, undertaking the most ambitious adventure she's had yet. Sure, she's not stopping a man that morphed himself into a dragon, a scientist that morphed himself into a giant spider, or an Egyptian god that morphed himself into the dirt, but the writing team is certain that this character-driven story will be well worth your dollar. I'm most proud that we've crafted an emotional, character-driven story. We'll take a deeper look at Lara's relationship with her best friend, Jonah. And in Dr. Dominguez, we have an antagonist who is really Lara's equal. Yo, our hero's got a sword in new heights, baby. Oh, shit. Well, before we kill off Manuel, let's take it back to 2013. Again to see how our hero got to where she is today. Initially, we were teased with an open world, and gameplay which would coincide with the story of how a survivor was born, how an innocent but adventurous college graduate gained her love for the treasure hunting game. I hate Tomb. To put a long story short, what we got was a combat system overhaul making Tomb Raider's gunplay more in line with a modern third-person shooter. We also got some tweaks to the modern style of platforming that the series had been shifting to for the last three games. The new combat, the writer's desire to tell a compelling narrative, and a complete disregard for how the two should mesh together gave us a standard third-person shooter for the modern age. So, by the standards of shooters that have come before it, you know the ones that have distinct movement, distinct enemies, Weapon variety, which offers different tactical advantages and disadvantages. Combat choices because of how well the foundation was laid. Chemistry between the player, the enemies, and the environment. You know, like a fucking video game. 2013 was, uh, pretty shit. 
Sure, Lara can now point and shoot as well as any of her competitors, but the combat was very bare bones due to a total of three human enemy types which spanned the duration of the campaign, one enemy type that was only used in the game's opening sections, and poor AI matched with the typical set of difficulty options. To elaborate, if you set the combat to easy, then the enemies would die quickly, make subpar decisions, and fail to hit the broad side of a JC Penny with a hand grenade. Those attributes coupled with her high damage threshold and ability to heal out of damage instantaneously meant any brand new player with any concept of shooters would easily handle this challenge without a second thought. After some player observation, I guess this difficulty likely only exists to appease players who don't like to partake in this genre of game. The, uh, the survey one. Yeah, no! I won that in Comic Con. I saw you like assy and left. No! You asked like this like random lady or like off the- If combat was on the harder end, then enemies hit like trucks, absorb damage better than your father dealing with his abusive spouse, and had the accuracy of a Naruto character forcing you into the whack-a-mole style of gunplay when they had ranged weapons. This resulted in a character with a pretty diverse skill set stuck behind cover aiming for headshots for a sizable portion of the game. On the non-combat side, Lara now had the bow and arrow which was combined with rope to help her traverse gaps, tether platforms, and hold things open. All of its potential uses were restricted to single rooms, which was also the new size of the tomb's Tomb Raider would be raiding. This was a severe step down from her old multi-route dungeon tomb raiding exploits of the past, which is what likely drew the original fans there in the first place. Basically, new Lara didn't do anything exceptionally well. I go even further and argue that certain elements go on to trample the more important aspects of the game. Unfortunately, this combination of bare bones puzzles with bare bones shooting seems to hit a sweet spot for the target consumer. Because as long as Tomb Raider costs what it does, it's unlikely a more focused game, despite how successful they can be when made with care and passion, is going to be produced. The groundwork was laid, and Lara was now on the modern AAA gaming conveyor belt, complete with all the people who tend to populate those spaces. Why'd I say that line? Well, a few years pass and Rise of the Tomb Raider came into existence. If I could put my finger on a single, mainstream critique of 2013, it was that Tomb Raider wasn't doing much Tomb Raiding. Uh I would say, for compared to the two, uh, two, the, two the two previous games, uh, the way we approached the tombs was way different. Um, but it was a natural evolution from Rise because 2013 tombs were not that you know that were, were not that you know uh, I would say uh, big and were not that memorable compared to Rise, for example. The crux of her character had been made completely optional. The response was to make the crux of what her character was completely optional, a second time, and repackage what they wanted more of in the forefront. This time a few new mechanics conducive to puzzle design were introduced, and tangible upgrades to Lara's skill set were held as the reward for completing these optional brain teasers. The strict, linear paths would open up to some larger spaces giving some more moments to breathe between combat set pieces. These also house some of the newly implemented side quests. It still had an infatuation with its cinematics and story, but some folks on the team certainly had their lighthearted fun crack through the AAA walls. Lara could meme with her Gen 5 and 6 costumes, chicken tossing was added with no tangible purpose. It's really all I have, I know my inflection implies I'm gonna say more, but... No. The combat did not improve mechanically, but instead Optus to focus... Optus... Imagine trying to read, but instead opted to focus more on stealth. The goal being to take out all enemies in a linear sequence without being spotted a la 007. Besides one instance, all these function in a binary state of spotted or unspotted with no in between. You will not shake off these enemies once they see you. You're going to pay your alimony. The courts will find you. 
The puzzles still allowed you to skip them entirely by virtue of Lara's mouth or a beacon, and they were still contained in optional isolation, bar a few instances. Still more to do here. I'll be back this way. Dude, fuck you. New Lara was steadfast in her new ways, and Tomb Raider would continue to be a standard third person shooter. It's now 2018. Some, uh, some things have happened prior, and certain people continue to express ongoing disdain for how some things have turned out. For the average media consumer invested in the fictional worlds of their favorite IP, well... is literal perfection. It will be. When it fits a woman. Can you believe it? Believe it! Believe it! A female hero. Why would you want his? Because I take things away from stupid, evil old men. It's what I do. And now we're gonna go to the women who are ruling the galaxy far, far away. Excitement is hitting a high note for the new Star Wars. The men in black don't. Don't start. I'm working on it. But there's good news. The U.S. has achieved gender parity across all levels of the education system. And women earn over two-thirds of all master's degrees. And earn over half of all doctoral degrees. I gave you what you always really needed. I made you into my pet. I am not a hamburger! I am a human being! Let's just say this wasn't their uh, quadrennial. For the third act. Crystal Dynamics teamed up with Eidos Montreal Visual, getting some insight into their development process, at least what's been allowed to seep through on the public sector. It seemed the team's aspirations were mainly focused on closing their story. Honestly, listening and reading about this stuff was a little disheartening. You hear them describe certain practices as basically childish. Because now in the game industry, this is how I feel, we're way more mature than we used to. I'm 45 now, when I started in the game industry was 20 years ago, and I would say that the way we were thinking is very different, like, yeah, whatever, let's put there where everything is cool. Yes! And today, because also the audience, you know, matured a lot, and the audience way smarter. So to be able to recreate and bring them to a real place, we had to do all our own work for that. So we also work with an historian at the beginning for the architecture to make sure that because we have a mix of Mayan architecture and Aztec architecture and Inca uh, architecture, architecture, because it's a work of fiction. But we want to make sure it was grounded on, 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 on really on, on, on what could be real. And given how the game begins, I was certainly expecting more developer interviews on how diverse their crew was or something about how Lara low-key wanted Abby to show her a South American copy of Iron Fist and how that was an inherent good for breaking some societal glass ceiling. You know, the usual BS about strong female characters. You feel extra proud to bring this story with so many strong and diverse female roles to the big screen? Yeah, I'm very happy that my two daughters can grow up and go to, to the cinema and have a strong female figure to look up to. Character played by Gong Li says to Mulan, impossible. A woman leading a man's army. And, and this is what I do, in spite of my best efforts to make it a woman's army. It's a film is still a man's army, and, and but in this case, all of my generals were women. From what I could find, there weren't many articles that touched the topic, and even those that did didn't harp on it too much. With all that said, it's still really bizarre how the game begins. This is something I'd expect from like, late 2019, 
Definitely 2020, but this kind of thing front in my Tomb Raider game really just gives me the vibe that some cuck from marketing stepped in at the 11th hour to throw in some last minute suggestion to justify why Anne was gonna gun down the last of the Mohicans indiscriminately. Uh, the hardest part of the development here is the balance between familiar yet different, and it was very different for uh, difficult at the beginning because you, we knew that we had a mandate to close this trilogy, and I've been working to the you know previous two games. Uh, we knew, I knew that we had to close this trilogy, but at the same time we wanted to create something very you know something fresh, a big difference between Rise and this game. It was very important without changing. Uh, the identity uh, of the actual trilogy. This is gonna be one of them tangents. So if you're here to get into the nitty gritty, then just skip to some time in the future. I don't know when it's gonna be. I'm assuming I have the foresight to calculate this when it's over and put the timestamp on screen somewhere, but yeah, we gotta be one of those channels right now. Because your god of choice, last name Christ, this really has it all in a single frame. As someone who literally just wants to put the game in the game playing system and turn it on to get going, this screen has the literal opposite effect of its intended purpose to be inclusive. As if it has to be condescendingly told to you in the modern age. As if this whole time when you were buying games from gens 1 through 8, you were secretly worrying about if Tyrone was on the development team. Like back when you picked up Pac-Man from the local dealer and you put it in your shitty Atari because it's the bootleg version, you looked to your older brother before powering it on and said, Man, I really hope the development team had everybody in the room. Your older brother looks straight through you. He sees dad pulling up the curb back from work visibly displaying signs that he's had a rough day. He hands you the controller, leaves out the back window, and you? You get the beating of your fucking life. But at least while he's ruthlessly slamming your face into that concrete wall, you knew that the game you were trying to play was developed by a multicultural team. At the time of this review, this shit is simply just really, really tired. Like, it has played itself out. This fucking shit with race, gender, hoes, tricks, marks, mark-ass tricks, trick-ass marks, skeezers, skanks, skick skags, and scallywops. I was just frankly antagonized by the nerve of this marketing manager. The fucking cojones on this guy. To insinuate that just because my dad's not coming home from the QT, that I need someone to welcome me to the experience. I am called the game statistic. So let's do that. Knowledge is power! We felt the need to throw in this message prior to the game starting because we've apparently got this big representation problem in media. It's such a problem. People have to pat themselves on the back whenever our protagonist has their color slider turned down an appropriate amount. Or if they don't have a dick. Or if they do have a dick. Supposedly, a certain character archetype has been running around uncontested in OU for the last eight generations. The developers have called for a nerf to the type as a whole. But fuck that. Fuck the history. Fuck the current landscape. If you want something to change, you start with the kids. So I'm gonna check what my generation was growing up on. What was TV portraying for kids back in the day? Now in this video, I certainly don't have the time to examine every single show geared towards the children of my generation. Is what some other cuck would say, but the information is finite. It can be collected. Trends can be concluded. You must be Mickey, and Vance, and Gretel, and Russ, and you must be BJ. Hi, 
Welcome to another video inside of your video. Last chance to dip. Really? For this examination, we're simply aggregating certain values that exist in all Western storytelling media geared for the kids from the years 1990 to 2008. I'm checking to see what media folks near my age were scarfing down their throats by all major networks while they were easy to influence. Or more appropriately stated, in the stories being told, did a certain character archetype dominate the metagame? Utilizing a compromised network of information, I count 229 shows to be examined. The research and findings will be left below for full transparency. If you are expecting something in the official format utilized by experts in the field, don't. So, few things to note. Several shows in the following formats have been removed from the study, since I'm only trying to focus on Western narrative television. So things like game shows, documentaries, educational programs, musicals, anime, which would boost minority representation through the roof, miniseries, which failed to last for more than a few episodes, and anthologies slash variety shows with swapping characters every single episode, were left out. The anthologies and variety programs would swap between many different characters of many different descriptors for one-off scenarios. I believe the only one of this type to make it to the analysis was Kablam, since it had a consistent set of shows it rotated between. So all of the shows in Kablam were simply treated as their own independent thing. All of these other omitted programs were available to kids, but when addressing these people, I'm gonna stick to the narrative media of the West, since apparently we're the ones with the problem of representation. Once I weeded out the undesired media, I placed the remaining programs in four separate categories. These seem to cast a wide enough net over the 229 shows to successfully slot them into a nice and neat Excel box. This will also allow us to see if any one of these single categories has more of the claimed issue of representation than the others. The categories are... Very few of this type exist, and the parameters to slot a show in this box are as follows. The show must be about a single character as we follow them on their journey, however epic or mundane that is. This main character may come across many other sorts of supporting characters, but the narrative and primary focus of the show is the character in question. To put that into more strict terms, the main character is the focus for more than a two-thirds majority of the episodes. Other characters also consistently appear less than 40% of the time. The easiest example for this would be Samurai Jack. We get introduced to our narrative focus, and we follow his story for 62 episodes, occasionally getting his nemesis side of the story. He comes across many faces, but he doesn't have a consistent supporting cast, which would typically happen in the fantasy genre. The show's primary focus is the duo or trio in question. They may have a breadth of supporting characters, but the show's focus is on this core unit. A brother and brother. A hero and a villain, a cat and a dog. The core unit acts as the show's primary driving factor. Typically, this is easy to discern when the show is named after them. Now, one of these dichotomies may cause you to categorize certain shows in a different way than I have. Maybe to you, Aku is just as central as Jack, that he doesn't appear as often as you might think. So, friendly reminder, for each show fell in terms of its typing, will also be left below, and you can play around with the data as you see fit. This is a show about a group of people. They may just have a name, the show may not even refer to them, or the show may actually be named after a central character to this group, but the characters in these shows are rarely operating on their own, and they have a strong supporting network of characters which appear frequently. Maybe it's a group of friends, a ragtag bunch on a hero's journey, a group of people at work. These shows have a more ensemble cast than a simple duo or trio. Your everyday American family just trying to make it through the weekly grind. Mom, dad, the kids, the weird neighbor. We follow the lives of the whole family unit. It may have a more central character, but in this case, if the supporting cast was mainly the family, it gets slotted here. Easy enough. With these categories, I then split them up under each network I examined. Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, Disney, the WB. From these, I again subdivide the network programming into a cartoon or live-action product. 
This will allow us to see who is displaying what types of shows to our impressionable audience. Before we get started, we still have one round of categories to spawn in order to get the black and white. We have to set concrete parameters around character representation since we have a clear cut target on what people are bitching about. The characters of these shows will be split on their sex and race, and will keep both in a binary state. Male or female? White or not white? We will generate our numbers from the main and significant characters of the show. This means these characters will typically appear above the 40% margin, and they are important to the show's narratives. The leftovers of the cast, your one-off characters, your gag characters that appear infrequently, your semi-regulars that come on for like 5 episodes, these are deemed as minor characters, and these will not be counted towards our results. These definitions and who exactly was counted for what shows are of course in the research. Now, let's define our categories of representation. Doesn't get much simpler than that. Are they all white? If yes, it goes in this box. Next. Is more than two thirds of the significant characters white? If yes, your diversity characters are now tokens. Place in this box here. The majority of your cast is white, but they do not exceed the two thirds majority of total significant characters. Maybe like one or two more of the total cast is white, but you have a decent spread. They made the effort, slot it in here. No significant characters are white, slot it here. This variable has the same terms as the white majority. If the majority of the cast by a greater than two thirds margin is not white, then you have token white characters, slot it here. The cast is a good mix, but there's slightly more minority characters. It goes here. There is a 50-50 split on white and non-white characters, but there's four white people and two black characters and two Asian characters. Yeah, maybe one of them is from Italy and the other one's from Spain. And some mixed folk with lighter skin pigment from the US. We're pretty much ignoring European diversity, so yep. You're all getting lumped together too, racist. The show's significant characters are all non-human. Now when humans and non-humans intermix, we will count the race of the significant human shown and simply count the show towards that race's representation. To control the number inflation this naturally brings since some shows just inexplicably have that one human character in an animal show, we will create the control variable, mostly non-human. This variable will signal that either A, the majority of the main characters are non-human, or B, a greater than two-thirds majority of the show's significant characters are non-humans. We will apply this variable when needed and give numbers for both with and without this control. Again, all transparently listed here. The show's significant characters are 100% male. It goes here. By a greater than two-thirds margin, the show's significant characters are male. The show has a good mix of characters, but the cast is still slanted to a male majority by one or two, or less than or equal to a two-thirds margin. 100% woman, 100% here. Greater than a two-thirds margin, woman's favor. The show has a good mix, but it's slightly in favor of women, our typical two-thirds rule. Everybody is getting some. Nobody is being left out. Spoilers! Some shows that star females actually tend to have more male representation despite the fact the focus is not on them. This variable will tick up by one whenever a female is in the leading slot or the majority of your leads are female. Not 50-50, there must be more female leads when talking about a group or the titular character is a woman. Here's an example. The show Dora the Explorer. This show has a female lead. She is the titular character. 
The show has a greater than two-thirds supporting cast that is male. This would slot the show about Dora herself into the male majority category indiscriminately, making this appear like it was just another bro show. But it's not. It's her show. One more thing! Non-human characters such as genderless robots, inanimate objects, and the like were not counted towards a specific sex, no matter how stereotypically they acted towards that group. These are highlighted and you can of course adjust the numbers if you disagree with the call, but if it ain't biological, I ain't counting it. Now we got our pool of shows, we have our split of the networks, we have our categories, and we have our trackers for representation. So, let's break it down. Disclaimer, the graphs you will see below is the most generous sweep of representation counting, not factoring in our controls. I'll be sure to clarify how this impacts each section as we go along. Now, animated Nickelodeon totals 44 shows from this time period. Unsurprisingly, the majority of programs here featured non-human characters, making up 17 out of 44. Being generous and considering any human representation from significant characters, this drops it down to 11, tying it with shows that have a white majority. For how severe the problem is, kinda depends on how far you are in this representation train. Is any and all shows with more white characters problematic? If so, you're looking at a 21 to 10 ratio of white dominated shows to the minorities. You cool with it as long as an effort was made to include more humans from a different continent? Then we're looking at a 20 to 13 ratio. This is still by the generous counting standards in which the mostly non-human shows get counted towards their respective race. In Animated Nick's case, this control applies once to equal race, twice to white dominated shows, and three times to minority shows. So in this particular case, scrapping these shows actually works in favor of certain people. But I promise you, this is not the case for all networks. Based on how you feel about what's fair, you can then decide if you want to go with the ratios that only have human characters, or count with every show here, in which case you get a variation of spreads. You've got your options, but if you were watching Nick, the highest chance was you were watching some anthropomorphic show. There's no denying things go white words when only considering humans, but even the most hardcore ratio of 19 to 7 isn't really that bad given the population split at the time percentage wise. For the hardcore ratio, that's a combined 20% of the race population getting 26% of the shows, or roughly 32% if you're good with effort. You know, if you're not so petty that it mattered there were one or two more white characters. These demographics rise from this time span topping out at near 28% in 2010, so the harsh 26% estimate becomes a talking point towards the end of this timeline. Personally, as you can tell, I'm not that prudish and would say that the population has been overrepresented. But that is merely one network subsection, and we have yet to check the other side of the coin for animated Nick. Ah yes, the more valid of the complaints comes from the sexual side, and we can split it the same ways. If there simply has to be more women to count, or if you're good with an honest effort from writers that don't share your gender. Going hardcore, that's a 30 to 5 ratio of number of times men outrepresented women. Even with our control variables, it's really only applicable 2 out of 6 times, as in 2 shows where a woman was the lead with the majority male cast, so that'd be 28 to 7. If you're good with the honest effort, as in you did not care that there were a few more males, then you astonishingly have a perfect split of 22 to 22. Or if you take in the female lead variable into account, 21 to 23, since this time our control only applies to one of the shows in the male group. The only argument that can be made is that despite being 50% of the population, female-centric shows where they are the clear majority were on the lower end. But they were certainly far from excluded in terms of major roles, at least in animated Nick. From here on out, I'll just keep with the hardcore count versus the way I'd count the split, focusing on the human character shows. Racially, with the split at its worst, we're looking at a 28% minority representation for live-action Nick. The main reason being the shows about a cast. That's where a majority of your white-centric shows come from. The shows about a family unit actually focus more on non-minority, minority non-characters than not. They focus more on minority characters than not. Maybe it's some jab at the fact your family probably didn't look like this one. Like here, pretend dad didn't leave for 22 minutes. 
28% is the hardcore camp, but for the less prudish, this is 30%. Sexually, you're either arguing females only have the definitive representation upper hand 21% of the time, meaning they're sorely lacking, or you'll find that they've been adequately in the picture 75% of the time, more than enough for the demographic split. And we're not even talking about how they were portrayed when they did show up, because that's a whole nother rabbit hole. And blood couldn't brainwash you because? There's not a man alive who can tell me what to do. Look, I don't have any cute things to say. There's a lot of numbers to cover and I still have five more sections in this motherfucker. But at its worst, live action Nick represented racially and it's only up to snuff sexually if you don't mind the slight imbalance. But sexually, this is pretty much gonna be the case across the board. Oof. Cartoon Network sure didn't like the brothers, but even with this abysmal ratio, 21% technically satisfies the quota? At least in the beginning, then it falls off. Looks like their competitor was blowing them out of the water in this regard. Cartoon Network. For shame. Unless you're not a prick, in which case 32% is pretty damn good. Sexually, we'll see the same theme here. You're either saying women only had 10% acceptable representation or they had it 53% of the time, which is pretty close to the true population. Now, as for live action CN, yes, it was indeed a thing. There are only two shows to count. And racially at its worst, it's a 50% split. The number is 100% for the less stingy. Sexually, this is a 50% representation for each gender no matter how you slice it. But hey, kinda hard to fuck it up with a number like two. Cartoon Disney was also another network about anthropomorphic this or that's. They just like certain folk to be playing supporting roles. Even still, 26% only falls off slightly at the end, and 37% is more than enough for the less prudish. Sexually, it's the same story. Is it 15% or 62? But given the reputation, I expected it to be similar to Nick. Oh, Disney. Looks like they really did love the traditional white nuclear family. Must be why they're trying to make up for it now. But yeah, 22% at its worst, so it falls off for the hardcore. And 35% for the rest of us. Sexually, this is the same sentence I've been saying every time we get here. 12% or 85%? I'd say live action Disney was pretty good on this front. Even way back when. You know, coming into this, I thought it would be Disney that dropped the ball, seeing how they're so gung-ho about it nowadays. But who would have thunk the WB? I mean, hey, if you include anime, it's a different story. But on their own terms, 17%. Even at their worst, the other networks would still hit the population percentages in the early years. But for the less stingy, 31% is roughly on par with the others. But hot damn, sexually? This network was so based, they didn't give females the primary lead slot a single time. Totally insane Never mansplaining. Wrong! Their low ball is even worse than the others somehow at 5% when women were clearly dominant. And that's not even in a majority, that's just like having one or two more chicks. Even post-patch, WB only has a 33% in how I would divide the representation. Is there a streaming service for 90s kids WB? Oh uh, yeah! This is the only network I've looked where either greater than or equal to did not happen for the sisters. But given that's one out of seven networks, Eh, meh. So now we throw them all into a pot and see our aggregate score. So we casted our net over shows you were likely watching as a kid if you were around my age. And what do we get? Racially, 24% at the hardest of hardcore and 33% for the rest. In other words, based on population demographics, it's actually not too far off for who was in the country. Which is a little crazy to think about, but given that people were hopefully just telling the stories they wanted to tell, and that people likely don't fantasize about earthly races not their own, 
It's a little crazy how close the demographic marks were hit. Depending on where you stand, they either slightly over or underrepresented, but pretty damn close. Sexually, this is either your leg to stand on since women were only definitive in numbers by the hardcore 13.1% of the time, but for the folks fine with effort, women are adequately represented 58% of the time. These are just the hard numbers for the discussion of how often one simply appeared in kids' media for a certain window of time. Because if we're going to add other factors like what the characters were doing, their relevance, how they stacked against the others, expanding a net to shows meant for teens as well as adult content, well then we're having an entirely different discussion. But the kids on the come up basically got their fair shake numbers wise in terms of just seeing people like them, and now they're old enough to be part of the group influencing the next generation. If you want to check this out more in depth, please, by all means. This was pretty much just myself wasting months of my time for a pretty much pointless tangent just to say, Devs kindly fuck off. This is insanely patronizing and it doesn't need to be said. So yeah, Tomb Raider's happening. Right off the bat, besides this shit, there's already something wrong with how the game begins. And it was in the least likely way I expected it to be given the titles that preceded it. On the initial playthrough, I sat through the scene, but on every subsequent playthrough, I still sat through the scene and that's due to some change in the way the game loads. Now normally on the subject matter of a game's performance on certain hardware, I very much don't care. Well, usually. Games will typically spend the majority of their lifespan on hardware far more capable than their original constraints. The game runs at 24 frames a second. Until it doesn't. The vast number of resources being called will lag your game. Until they don't. Nowadays it's just does the game actually work as advertised upon release, or are we waiting for you to fix issues after several more patch installments? These are problems that the first wave of players gets, then they usually go away with time. Hopefully with a successful port, emulation, patches, a hardware swap, or maybe the game gets lucky enough to be worked again from the ground up. The reason I call attention to the game's new inability to skip certain cutscenes is because one, this problem just simply shouldn't exist since the first two games didn't have this issue, and this is the third and final installment in the trilogy, and two, I have a sneaking suspicion that hardware has nothing to do with this problem. So this issue will persist wherever the game goes. There's a reason I wait until well after a game's shelf life to review it. It's because problems like these should be resolved by the time you're calling the product completely finished. DLC and all. But it doesn't matter if you're playing it on the Xbox, the PS4, the PC, your PS5, the Solid Snake Pachinko machine downtown. No hardware changes seem to make a dent in these same cutscenes. Now being some illiterate, I can't really say what's happening behind the scenes for these specific events. I can't really say what has changed to allow for one game to be able to see dramatic load improvements overall with certain hardware changes and Shadow of the Tomb Raider. But luckily, I have the devs to tell me that. Ah, can't skip this one. <laughs> I think there's some Cinemax that you can't skip. <laughs> we were scared. So they took out the, the non skippable ones because we were. Uh, ah, loading is. Yeah, we were scared that we would cause out of memory issues if we uh, could skip some of them. Now, what he is saying is absolutely true. Well, I still have questions as to how this issue was successfully evaded in the last two games. Because unless it was indulging itself in some spectacle, there was no single cutscene you couldn't skip. That, and I feel there's enough evidence against the game to invalidate the concern. The first is the comparison between HDD and SSD storage. As long as we're not dealing with the unskippable sequences in question, the game actually sees a substantial improvement in load times. This is also on a rig with far more power than the base console Shadow was designed for, so whatever memory constraints the game was having should be long gone by the PC port. The SSD has a clear advantage in calling information, yet it still can't bypass certain cutscenes which must be watched every single time. Let's take the one that can't be skipped after solving the puzzle in Lara's home as a child. 
For any competent developer charging me the full AAA price tag, this cutscene should at worst be used as a more entertaining load screen while the game calls for the necessary assets to place us back to where we were in the jungle. Even on an HDD, the worst these load times got from menu was around 50 seconds, and the SSD was calling the same packed areas in half the time. But for some reason, I have to sit through this 3 minute and 7 second cutscene every single time it's encountered. Unable to skip even by the time we rejoin adult Lara back in the jungle area when the game should be more than ready to resume play. Why the game needs slightly more than 3 times as long to load or nearly 7 times as long to load if you factor in the SSD is simply beyond me. Even the transition into this sequence is suspicious. We get introduced to a much younger Lara and the game refuses to allow you to skip the sequence. Now nothing can actually kill little Lara, so it's unlikely you're going to be reloading a checkpoint, which one is created when you get to this area. But if, for whatever reason, you do reload a checkpoint in this substantially smaller map, the game kicks you back into the cutscene, still refusing to allow you to skip. Once you're in this map, the game should have no problem simply resetting Lara's position and recalling an earlier state so you can get going, but the fact that it kicked me into the same cutscene again with no changes was rather telling. Especially since we're loading a checkpoint in other instances with far more assets happens much, much quicker. In fact, if enough of the map is loaded in a single sitting, the game literally has no problem calling different sections of the game in the correct state. In order to reach the next firefight from this point, I need to first head to a house, solve a puzzle with Jonah so I can then enter a tomb, solve another puzzle with Jonah which involves watching more scripted sequences, kick off another cutscene, then have some big escape sequence where we just barely make it out at the last moment. I've slogged through that sequence of events several times by this point due to another one of the game's many design issues. So rather than repeat that sequence a fourth time, I simply saved my position in game with the trainer prior to the firefight and recalled it from the campfire on the other side of the map. By this point, I was familiar with the game's use of specific actions to trigger specific states, so I expected this method to bypass the bullshit to fail spectacularly. But to my surprise, calling Lara prior to the wall where the fight begins loads everything just fine, and the game was able to proceed as normal. And this is literally able to happen in game, nearly as fast as you can call for the game to load your checkpoint. And the distance I'm using here from Lara's current position to this specific checkpoint is also much smaller than the distance between the campfire and the firefight. Then there's the speedrunners that have figured out what exact pathing has to be taken in order to keep the game functioning the right way. Many of those essential unskippable cutscenes are completely bypassed, and the game is able to continue, albeit due to very specific pathing and reloading touch checkpoints since the game tends to softlock itself for not platforming it just the right way. Again, these cutscenes are insufferably far longer than the game needs to call any single portion of the map from the main menu or in game. Honestly, the nail in the coffin for me is not being able to skip the last cutscene directly to the credits, which you can then skip back directly to the main menu. There's literally zero reason for this to be the case unless you just had to have your scene play itself out. Because if you honestly expect me to believe there was a memory issue cutting from the game to a sequence of names with some music, you must think your audience is pretty stupid. It's these pieces of evidence that make me think the inability to skip these sequences isn't purely a technical one, but rather a desire to make me watch the efforts of the writing team, the voice team, the animators, the whole nine. Compare this to games which have far more effort placed in these departments, and hours upon hours of more content in this regard. One of these games allows me to skip every single event at any point regardless of the situation, and is able to load in and out of these sequences with no problem. What that says to me is that they understand not everybody is going to desire to watch every scene in its entirety, and that they're confident enough to allow the audience to engage at whatever level they wish to. This is potentially at the expense of nearly 20 hours worth of voice work, and that's why I greatly respect one of these games, and the other is Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Other performance issues I may as well mention since I'm on the topic is the Hidden City's frame rate, which still suffers despite running on top of the line hardware years after the game's initial release, the fights that can comically break, though these are far more infrequent, but funny nevertheless, 
and the other random movement bugs that occur. Laura, you're fucked. You're fucked. Oh, you're good. What, the fuck, what the fuck? What the fuck was that? We literally haven't even begun gameplay, and already we've been introduced to a pretty annoying issue. But we have much to cover, and we must persevere. Jonah, you there? Game 1 was a mess, in its introduction being a QTE affair, a single puzzle, followed by a self-indulgent escape sequence. Game 2 played it with a walk and talk, followed by a QTE affair, followed by a self-indulgent escape sequence. By this point, I felt I could pretty much predict how the game would start, which having Lara hold the control stick forward to watch some work done by the animators was pretty much par for the course. I mean, it's not like we just spent the last 2 minutes and 45 seconds watching Lara and Jonah argue in a plane crash, potentially against our will. When she gets out of the hole, you gain control for something disguised as your typical gameplay. But in reality, we're doing the walk and talk for the second time. The only thing for Lara to do here is climb up the wall, which the game takes as an opportunity to have her dialogue more with Jonah to set up the scenario. As is par for the course in the walk and talk, access to the parts of her skill set you would likely be using such as the sprint function are artificially disabled. Then we're tossed into another unskippable 3 minute cutscene of Lara being insufferable and Jonah having to keep his bitch in check. In Mexico, the walk and talk effectively continues, as we are still unable to engage with Lara's core mechanics. Nothing about this Mexico sequence involves platforming. Nothing about this Mexico sequence involves puzzle solving. Nothing about this Mexico sequence even involves firefighting. You're just still walking. Walking Lara along a path so you can admire all the effort that's gone into this set piece. And there's still more cutscenes to interrupt the cutscene you're playing. Just look around here for a second. How many times do games like this put a substantial amount of effort towards content that literally has nothing to do with the gameplay? First you had to make the section of the map that will never get used again. Then you had to make unique assets for this map that will never get used again. Tables, flowers, candles, lights, neon signs, balloons, grave decorations, masks, food items, a crowd of people to populate the space, and more. Now, because we have a crowd, some of them need to have dialogue, so we need to hire more voice talent, we need them to read lines, and we need to compensate them. The crowd then has to be animated to do unique things, so it appears as lifelike as possible. We have to code in the ability for Lara to talk to certain members, and spend more time animating those members to do more unique things. Now we have to extensively test this area just to make sure nothing goes wrong with Lara walking. Just walking needs to be a stable affair. We need to make sure she doesn't break the game by walking someplace she's not supposed to be. We have to make sure that our cutscenes play when she gets to certain spots. We need to make sure those lines by the crowd are triggered correctly. Our transitions to cutscenes all need precise camera control, animation, and lighting to look as good as possible. Then we justify it by saying, this is keeping up with the industry. Somehow, this just became the norm. Wasting everybody's time. Wasting everybody's effort on content that people will ultimately want to skip should they choose to run through the game again. Because this content isn't relevant to the gameplay in any way, shape, or form. Even here, there are cutscenes you simply just can't skip. You just have to keep Lara moving until you get to the first instance of actual gameplay. You might think it's here since she's jumped over the wall and has access to more of her skill set, but it's actually here once the game is done restricting movement after your first kill. See here Lara will still control how you walk, how you're going to kill, and set you up to basically outright win the first encounter. To, of course, lead you into more dialogue. Too many people just give this a pass, as if a big enough budget, a choice of style, or a genre just justifies increasing the cost of game development for superfluous content. Content that can't be skipped. Whether or not people do, Shadow attempts to encourage replays with its unlockable difficulty. A difficulty which brings the grievous amount of superfluous content to the forefront. And if you're going to design your game to have a replayability factor, this needs to be taken into consideration for the duration of the game. Shadow 
has no such concerns, however, and deadly obsession is the proof. Hey Jackie, do you want to play Shadow of the Tomb Raider on Deadly Obsession? I'm crazy, but I'm not stupid. Deadly Obsession is a mode you can only acquire once you've beaten the game. The gimmick here is that the game eliminates the generous checkpoint system and will only save at specific story events, few and far between. Otherwise, you're kicked back to the last campfire or major story event the game tossed you. On paper, the increase in difficulty that this brings combined with the more aggressive set of AI enemies is a welcome challenge for hardcore players. This means that they have to play out multiple instances of firefights, platforming and puzzle solving in succession without dying, lest they be forced to do it again. But the punishment of death is far more extensive than simply having to replay a challenge. Like reloading that checkpoint in the beginning of Young Lara's Home, forcing you to watch the same lines for no reason at all, your punishment for death is also the design of the game itself. The game taking its control away from you, the game putting you in a walk and talk, the game placing you in that same thrilling sequence where you just make it out at the last moment, the cutscenes you can't skip, the spectacles that have nothing to do with the core gameplay, you get to do it all, over. And over again, should you fail that firefight, should you fail that platforming section due to your own decisions, or Lara's refusal to cooperate. The issue here is not that you have to replay a challenge, it's the content in between the challenges that make it an insufferable fucking mess. When the punishment of Deadly Obsession is played straight, the content results in a more old school difficulty demanding you play the game without dying for longer stretches. These would be moments when Lara enters a tomb and must complete the entirety of the challenge without any checkpoints. This means no falling into the water, not failing to the enemies, and not missing any jumps. If you die in these instances, you simply pick up and begin again, only doing the things the game was designed for. So while the prospect of completing a tomb and being forced to restart due to a death on exit isn't the most tantalizing of ideas to all players, at the very least, replaying that segment is entirely in your control. As for the main campaign trail, this is not the case. We are here at the beginning, so let's apply Deadly Obsession. Once you've had your hand held for the first two kills, had movement restricted for a conversation, scaled down a mountain, had movement restricted to listen to story, had it restricted to move through a cave, had a forced eel encounter, watched Lara survive just barely, had movement restricted in the middle of a puzzle to talk to Jonah, and had movement restricted again to force another stealth kill, something your very first kill forced you to do, meaning you should have the autonomy to make that decision yourself here. After you do that, THEN you get to the firefight where you have full control. If you fail for whatever reason, you are then kicked back to the first two kills. That in and of itself is not the issue. The issue is that the game will still treat this like it is your first time playing these events, despite the fact that A, you've already played the story out in full because you are playing Deadly Obsession, therefore this is all unnecessary, and B, you've already played out these events in this exact save file, yet the game is still unable to recognize this fact. In other words, death means having your hand held again, having the break punts for you again, having the same cinematic scares on the mountain scaling again, having the same encounters, watching the same sequences, and getting interrupted at the exact same points. The fix for this is as follows. Once the player is given control at this point, this scene needs to remove the scripting that forces Lara into certain actions, same as if she revisits an area in the same save. From this point, how the enemies are killed should be up to Lara since they should be familiar with her skill set. Funny thing for this first kill is that since you've laid things out in this way, the player will likely kill this man in the same manner as the game forces them to. The best option for an uncertain player here is most certainly stealth since the guard has his back turned, there is cover directly behind him, and the player does not know how many more enemies are in the immediate area. But you're too stupid to be trusted to do this in 2018, and the game will force this. It is actually insane that basic level design like this is insulted with this kind of handholding, because you might miss that the girl who can kill with impunity can kill silently as well. As you move on, Jonah should never attempt to call Lara, and Lara should never attempt to call Jonah. The player is fully familiar with what's happening at this point, and they should only be here if they are scavenging. Otherwise, they should be left alone to move on. 
The bullshit with the rocks crumbling to get a reaction out of Lara needs to go. We saw it the first time, now we're potentially just trying to get back to what we were doing. Once under the water, the player should only come into contact with an eel if they don't sneak by them like in later sections. This sequence of her climbing up the water tunnel needs to go, like just have it be something the player can skip. This area is fully loaded, this is not a mask to hide a hidden load time, it's just tedious. Again, there should be no camera pans or phone calls while working through the puzzle. Having to repeat it is punishment enough. Then once we return, there should be no more theatrics. We're back where we were, and we should be able to play through this firefight however we wish. Basically, if you've ever died at this first firefight on Deadly Obsession, then you've watched a combined three minutes of your time watching Lara say and do things she shouldn't be doing just to replay the section. So on top of repeating the gameplay, it's like watching the second cutscene with Lara and Jonah on top of that every single time. This waste of time summarizes Deadly Obsession on the main story path. Not only do you get to play it all again, you get to watch it all as well every single moment. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is not designed for replays because Shadow of the Tomb Raider does not respect your time because despite the budget, it's apparently asking too much that these little common sense things be placed in for players already familiar with the story. Deadly Obsession is not difficult because it has more challenging gameplay. Deadly Obsession is just a test of your patience. There's nothing difficult about wasting someone's time. Hell, I'm doing it right now. And I only make 199 as a server at Wendy's. So, Lara, or Anne, or whatever the fuck this person's name is, makes it to the first firefight. At least before, Anne kinda sorta looked like Lara, but now this bitch just looks like she wears underwear with dick holes in them. But, she made it. She's here. The first firefight of the game. Which means now, we're in combat territory. Let's make one thing perfectly clear. In the series of Tomb Raider, where combat was formerly jumping your ass out of the way in one of four directions before a classic case of domestic violence took place, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, bar none, has the best combat system in the franchise. However, at best, the combat is serviceable, and we're talking when shit's actually doing what it's supposed to. It plays out how you would expect at this point, like a cover-based third-person shooter, at best. And honestly, it's a shame, because Shadow could actually have a lot going on, at least more than its previous entries. Lara has the means and options other third-person shooter protagonists don't have, but it still keeps close to the structure of 2013 and Rise, because when they deviate from that structure, one finds the combat is... subpar. Or at worst, outright broken. Down there with the lowest of the low. I feel like I made a mistake here. <gasps> okay, you know what I could do? You know what I could do? Hell yeah. Check it out. What's that beeping? What's that red beeping light on a dead corpse? Please, dude, go look at that. Dude, I hate this. With the, I, I wish they'd like go towards it. Like, it's a fucking red beeping light. Good thing you have a gun. Oh, oh. sir, hold on, sir. Uh oh, hit me again. Hit me again. Where, where, what are you? Where are you going? Hurry, I'll fix it. Got something. You still up for this? I think she's gone. Where'd she run off to? The one thing that could really be good about this game is practically just an afterthought. It literally may as well be. See, here's what we have on the table. Anne is pretty much ported over from Rise of the Tomb Raider. On her murderous rampage through the good, hard-working folk of Trinity, she gets the ability to sneak attack from a tree, loses the ability to make platforms, and now her arrows can make people kill each other. That last one in the endgame. She still controls when you hide, still handles with standard dual analog control with some adjustable settings, still moves around like a jungled chimpanzee, 
still plants the corpse bombs, still crafts arrows, still has an overpowered axe that wins one-on-one -on -one engagements even on harder difficulties, still dodges encounters, still has access to health in a pinch. More or less, this is Anne. The main new gripe with her movement system in combat is her and walls. She just opts to cling on to them when you don't necessarily want to, like say if you're trying to run away, make a sharper turn, or position yourself to fire back at an enemy pursuing yourself. Sometimes she just refuses to do it despite that being the thing you want to do, but hey, giving the player a simple button command to toggle this shit is simply beyond our hundred million dollar programming. Remember, you're stupid. You're just some mainstream consumer ape, and you're gonna like what we give you. What has significantly changed about combat is the enemies. Not the environment. The environment changes entirely superficial. You are now in the jungle instead of the snow. Oh, wow. Nah, like Rise, Shadow has a stealth component. Lara will usually start combat sections with the drop on enemies, and she can stealth kill her way through most or all of it. But unlike Rise, failure isn't a permanent state. See, in Rise, once the enemy sees you, that's it. These niggas gotta get their welfare check from you. Anne's name may as well have been Andrew, and every single enemy of Vindictive X wife. They know where you're at, and they're gonna get theirs. There's only one area in Rise where the enemies will lose track of Lara, and that's the only area she can naturally backtrack out of a fight from. I want to make some unfunny joke to compare the enemies of Shadow to, but just dead ass, the enemies in Shadow are clinically stupid, and compared to its peers in the genre, Shadow still has low enemy variety. Enemies with a handgun and knife. Enemies with a two-handed weapon. The same two-handed weapon type that has armor covering. The same long-range, short-range enemies with lower tech. Aggro zombie enemies and four-legged animal. If you had a zombie with more health, it's effectively the same enemy as the tougher four-legged animal. It's aggro, it goes for close quarters, you're trapped in an arena with it, Dodge, and counterattack, or just fucking shoot it. There you go. Fuck you. <laughs> they think they have nine, they functionally have three. The ones with the handguns or short melee weapons are able to keep on Lara far better than any of their two-handed weapon counterparts. And their main role is to combat against just how good cover and stealth the main feature are in this game. A, because the animal and zombie will not be there in the standard firefighting environment to assist the morons of Trinity. And B, because they don't lose track of Lara when she falls out of the line of sight for like three seconds. And I'm not being facetious, the two-handed weapon types are not equipped to deal with the options provided to Lara. Oh dear. Ah, the kettle is boiled. You're dead already. Can't let her get the drop on me. Waiting for it. Shit, there's more of them. Better give up or you can. I showed up. Cover me. Need to reload. She's still out there. Give up. <laughs> Here, while actively attacking her, this guy simply just loses track of her position despite this context because he and others like him lack object permanence. Even in Deadly Obsession, the absolute hardest the game can get. He sees her, he shoots at her, she dips, he picks a direction, and then he just fucks off. 
It almost seems like a toss-up on what direction the AI will pick once the aggro wears off. Sometimes they'll make a contextually stupid choice like running away or just walking towards a wall to stare at. And other times, they'll be fortunate enough to be allowed to somewhat stay in your vicinity. But that's not their only problem. Here's Lara throwing a gas canister at two enemies. They blow up, and no one cares to investigate it. They just stay in their lane. Dumb at the same time. They really are. It's a mystery. <laughs> Nope. These men just pick and choose what the fuck is important to them, at whatever time. Here Lara threw an explosive in front of two enemies. The first appears aggroed and seems to be going for a flank, and the second one who bore witness to the attack does not flinch and fails to get triggered at all. To the point where he literally turns around right before spotting Lara. <laughs> Why did you just turn around? Oh my god. The enemy that ran to flank never attempted to ambush from behind, likely because Lara was out of sight for too long. The worst case scenario is that the enemy was just running with no discernible purpose. To add insult to injury, here's a completely different player throwing an item on the roof, causing one of the men to actually climb on the roof and investigate the source in the same area. I love this game. I'm gonna spook him with on the roof. So I was telling you, if you hold RB while holding an object, you craft it into a better object. Oh, he's actually going up there. Now here's Lara after failing a stealth kill. She's got too bold, and one enemy caught on. Now five enemies go to pursue her, catching her out in the open. But by just running away, four of them kill themselves because they know Lara's gonna do it anyway. And that happened multiple times on Deadly Obsession. What? Is everybody dead again? Here's Lara giving away her position to attack an enemy that doesn't seem to care until he's nearly dead. But since she's out in the open with no immediate cover, the enemies are able to do her in. How did you miss? That consistent. In fact, without stealth, the two-handed weapon enemies proved to be able to hold their own. Now here's the same encounter with stealth. Sure. You do that. Oh, you know the Abba song. Are you for real? You're just gonna all run in here. I mean, I'm, I'm cool with that. That's fine. And this retard doesn't see it. He doesn't see his own friend being murdered right in front of him. He's stunned. He is amazed at how all of his teammates <laughs> are this fucking stupid. His friend, his lifelong partner, murdered in cold blood by a 115 pound white woman. And yet he can't fathom. He doesn't know. Where did everybody go? I'm looking right at her. Hang oh, on, how it must dare be fine. you presume Lara's weight? <laughs> I guess I'll just go here right now. Back in the bushes. See you later, guys. No matter the setting, it simply proves too much for the AI to bear without a mass of numbers. They can occasionally catch her and engage, but without their support, members of these enemies are just simply not equipped to deal with the options provided to Lara. Hell, even with their support members, these enemies are not equipped to handle the options provided to Lara. Or, not a level, but the first area. That they're easy. How did you not get hit with that blast? If I have to look for you, it's just gonna make me more angry. I've got to handle this. 
The man with gun enemy type is the most used enemy type in the game. Out of the 17 mandatory enemy encounters, they are your opponent 11 out of 17 times. Their substitutes in the Serpent Guard are used twice out of those 17 times, and they abide by the exact same rules. The melee enemies are supposed to keep Lara moving because the ranged attackers are clinically retarded. So for all intents and purposes, Man with Gun is used 13 out of 17 times. See, I'm fairly certain that the goal for combat is to get Lara using Guerrilla Warfare naturally. She's supposed to put on the mud, take cover, kill a few people, go back into cover when she's spotted, and keep this ebb and flow to slowly pick off the enemies. Like a predator. This point in the story is supposed to be her apex. Her at her most competent. Pretty sure that's what the goal of combat was. And yet for some reason with a hundred million dollars, a hundred fucking million dollars, the level design does not assist this goal. These are the same arenas she has been in for the last two games. They were made for firefighting. These were small compact spaces with some cover made for an AI that would never lose target. But because we've altered how we want combat to play without changing this level design, the AI has to be a lobotomized version of their last incarnation to simulate what guerrilla warfare should be. The other enemy types don't suffer from the stupidity at all and benefit from having level design enclose Lara with them in smaller spaces. Though even these encounters have their faults. But these guys are far too stupid to handle Lara hiding behind the only wall in existence around them. The linear trail and small arena setting do not serve these enemies well in most instances. But if you think otherwise, here's a summary of all the mandatory encounters. Gone. The first firefight here begins with a linear path with some crates and vegetation to hide behind before ending up in an enclosed combat arena. Failing to completely stealth the area will cause the guards to call in heavily armed Trinity soldiers, and unless the player knows the two-handed enemies are clinically stupid, they'll likely just play it out like any other shooter. The second fight is against a jaguar in a small space highlighting the dodge and counter mechanic. The third fight is against a single jaguar in a much larger arena. The fourth fight may as well be considered an interactive cutscene because any deviation from the way they want you to kill the enemies results in your death. The fifth fight is a linear trail to the first tomb with vegetation to hide, giving the handgun enemy a chance to assist their teammates. If they are killed first, the fight's over. The sixth fight is a small arena with vegetation and Trinity soldiers assisted by their better AI counterparts. This is right after being given the skill to kill from trees. The level design really wants you to utilize that skill for the first kill, but the player is likely to just play this out like they did in Rise since they have access to a fully automatic arsenal. Performing the tree kill leaves Lara out in the open, and the time she spends in the kill animation can be enough to get her shot down. The seventh is a linear trail leading up to an arena, honestly a little too big given the AI of the Serpent Guard. The eighth is a small arena with melee enemies. The ninth is a repeat of the 8th in a more open environment, but Lara is still trapped in this puzzle area with the enemies. The 10th is a small arena with the low-tech man-with-gun enemies. The 11th is a linear trail forcing you to use non-projectile weapons. The 12th is a point A to B track that branches off one of two ways and is objectively the best combat section in regards to the guerrilla warfare premise. The 13th is a bombastic cover-based firefight where Lara needs to shoot barrels and blow things up. The 14th is two small arenas back to back. The 15th is a linear path with generous cover until the last section where it's a blatant cover based shooter. The 16th is a bombastic point A to B trek where guerrilla warfare is tossed out the window. The 17th is the final boss. The level design here is essentially Rise of the Tomb Raider, the difference being that AI and Rise will actually put up far more of a fight. Given the way Lara and the enemies are set up here, the fix for combat lies in the level design. The AI needs tweaking as well, but hear me out. The goal of combat is quite clear. We want Guerrilla Warfare to be the star of the show. Hit and run. And honestly, played right, it can make for one of the more unique combat systems for a Tomb Raider game. So to facilitate this, we need Lara, the level design, and the enemies to come together in a way that makes Guerrilla Warfare the best possible option for the player. 
People, especially those seasoned in shooters, will usually find the best tactical response and stick with it. So if busting out the assault rifle works 90% of the time you're confronted with a problem, you're not really going to bother with stealth. We have to get this environment to punish the options we don't want people making a good deal of the time. So here's the template I would start with. Let's say this is a substitute for the fifth fight. Lara has a goal, get to the tomb by whatever means necessary. That's it. We're not going to explicitly force the player to kill anything. Next, we're going to swap out the linear route with the more open sandbox, which will allow the player to make their own decisions based on what's best for their own skill level. This will also assist replaying sections the more ways we can allow Lara to effectively traverse the area. Here we have the same elements that the game is currently using. We'll restrict our play area with more dense vegetation and mountains represented by these textures. The dense vegetation will purely function as a boundary setter, but the rock texture will represent things she can potentially climb on and add some verticality to her movement. We'll have the bushes she can hide in represented by these textures, and some wood she can run through in trees to climb on shown by this texture. Think spots more reminiscent of the opening. Thick fog, low visibility, and high tree density. This will allow some opportunities for the tree stealth kills. Finally, there is water she can swim in and mud she can utilize to enhance her ability to blend into the environment. Again, this is just shit the game already has. For this particular map, the goal is to also get the player to learn options more naturally rather than just being told directly by the game. This is our introduction to Guerrilla Warfare. We start off with some bushes which we can show to be highly effective. Then as she heads towards the goal, we'll present different styles of approach. Going to Lara's left, she'll have a small section of woods, an enemy camp, and some rock formations. Through the center is mud, wood, rock, and water. Remember, she doesn't strictly have to go around everything, we're stating Lara can scale these objects. Climbing something like this will give Lara a better view of her surroundings and allow the tomb to be visible from a distance, but enemies will also be able to spot an attack. Punishing Lara out in the open isn't too tough for the harder AI, so this shouldn't be much of an issue to get working. Going to her right, we have water, mud, woods, and a smaller enemy barricade to play around. Again, no path is mandatory, and the player can run through this any way they like for the best result. Next, we need our enemies, which are shown by these Google image icons here. This isn't saying that there's only one or two enemies here, it's to represent small groups. The lines here will represent how they're going to move in the map, and the camp icon depicts a higher concentration of enemies. We're going to mix enemies that are more stationary with ones that are actively traveling through the map to introduce an element of RNG. On paper, this should protect against the player learning a single pattern to play around, especially if we constantly change the patrolling enemies' starting positions and have them move along different tracks per load. We can have the enemies split between one or all of these tracks at random and adjust them based on results from game testing. Our goal with the enemies is to account for Lara's skill set. The fact that she has access to powerful automatic weapons presents a real problem to small groups in isolation, as they are easily overwhelmed. There's also no reason why Lara would not arm herself, so just taking these things away isn't really a believable solution. Instead, the solution is to make Trinity a real standing army, not just a couple of mooks that Lara can plow through here and there. The best example of an appropriate enemy response actually comes from the DLC, where Lara can be overwhelmed by the Serpent Guard if she gets trigger happy right off the bat. Now this is our introduction to the main combat mechanics, so I have enemy density relatively low, but the idea here is to heavily punish sound and encourage stealth naturally. If Lara starts at this point and sees the first group of guards, then decides to just shoot them down with their most powerful weapon, the rest of the AI needs to hone in with sheer force and numbers, like they need to roll in deep. As soon as that first shot is made, I'd say two things need to happen. One, any patrolling unit nearby needs to close in on the noise and they need to do it intelligently. If units 1 and 2 hear sounds of a struggle, they need to approach that source from multiple angles and be able to hit like a truck to put Lara down. Two. One enemy in the ambush needs to attempt to call for backup, and if Lara does not kill this enemy in time, an even bigger backup unit will show up. The enemies can come from either the map's own supply or a helicopter drop in the form of armored enemies to punish that brazen mistake. You can even pull a metal gear and allow Lara to hear the enemies radioing for backup. You want to give the player a healthy fear of loud sounds, so killing this first group with an assault weapon should be an immediate teaching lesson as to why you don't choose to do that at all times. It needs to be a trade-off. 
Yeah, your assault weapons are more powerful, but they will also raise the immediate difficulty by drawing in more enemies, forcing you back into hiding, lest he be slaughtered like a sow. If he successfully punished that choice through gameplay, then the player will start to look at their other options. Okay, there's a group of enemies, they're kinda together, but also a little spread out. I have some bushes, I have a bow and arrow, they put two and two together, and then they choose to use quieter kills. And based on the nature of how we want the enemies to respond to sound, mistakes will be punished at varying levels. Maybe the player manages to quietly kill everybody in the group save one man, and then they're spotted. Well now, all they have to do is just use the bow and arrow to finish their job before they call in for more soldiers. No harm, no foul. Maybe they fuck up halfway through their kill chain and a soldier begins firing at Lara. Now more guards are aggroed, and Lara needs to go back into hiding to get the new scope of the threat before either attacking again or backing down since the number of men is deceptively high. They can risk it for the biscuit and just try to put down the soldiers they're already fighting, but more men should be flooding in within a reasonable time frame from any sounds of a struggle. So even if Lara does gun down the bat she was fighting, she shouldn't feel comfortable enough to stay put and hold the line, since more sounds means more problems. The map should also not allow for Lara to limit things to a single point of entry. She should always be vulnerable from all sides. On paper, this should be guerrilla warfare. You hit until you have to run. The enemy should be forcing Lara to run. And the level design should allow for Lara to run until she goes back on the offensive. The best possible response Lara can implement should be constantly changing as she moves towards the tomb. That's all well and good on paper, but from here it needs many, many hours of testing to get the feeling right. We want that predatory style of combat to be in focus, we want the enemies to force Lara back into hiding when she gets bold, they need tweaking with their AI so that when the mistakes are made, they're still able to find a Lara attempting to hide, but it's not so unfair that a single mistake means death. The level design can't allow for stealth to be overpowered, the cover placement has to force Lara out of hiding every once in a while so that she's extremely careful about how she advances in the terrain. We need enemies to punish obvious solutions without blocking off all solutions. The example here would be the guards near the water. The water takedown would be easy to execute, so we place a group at a higher vantage point to cover for them if Lara gets tunnel vision on that target without taking all possible angles of attack into consideration. We need enemies to have an element of randomness to create uncertainty. We need them to be able to spot Lara carelessly running around in the open and punish that with force of numbers. We want the player asking questions like, is what I'm about to do viable? Is it safe to do what I'm about to do? Should I even engage? Is the coast clear for me to make this move? Then you need to build on this foundation with different maps as the game proceeds. Maybe stripping away certain types of cover, changing up the style of terrain, there's so much potential with the mechanics the game currently has. And if you got this part right, you would have had a shooter that's very fun to replay. These could have been long, uninterrupted sections of gameplay that the player had fun experimenting in. Sections that were memorable because of how anxiety-inducing it was just getting to the tomb. A third-person shooter style that was all its own and capitalized on Lara's moving ability. One that worked with the branching skill tree system which would allow for different approaches to the same situation. Like, hey, don't want enemies spotting corpses? That's when luring enemies into the woods and using the tree kill would come in handy since you could leave the dead enemy out of sight. You could use sound to your advantage with the corpse bomb since you could set one, move away, get the delayed kill, and draw enemies away from your intended path. Just, just valid options. You could have used achievements in these sections to make the player experiment with different styles. You could have one for managing to stealth kill everybody in the map undetected, one for avoiding combat altogether, Maybe have the enemy camps house stolen treasures from nearby tombs and have an achievement be getting these items without arousing suspicion. Guerrilla Warfare could be a very fun game on its own. And if you were to throw in competent tombs on top of this, shit. Hell, competent tombs that had some of the Guerrilla Warfare elements within them, shit. Wasted potential. That is what I see when I play this game. The groundwork was developed and then we made Rise of the Tomb Raider, but in the jungle with the retards. And you know what else? We're still fucking here! So this combat section is the first of many arenas, but those coming from Rise will be very familiar with the setup. Lara starts here with a drop on the enemies, and she can quietly kill her way to the gate. 
If she fails, then an enemy reinforcement group is dropped in. This is the only time in the game that a group of reinforcements is used as a direct punishment for failing stealth, at least until the DLC. For every other scenario, Lara can get spotted at will and return to hiding with no added enemy threats. Lara is fully armed at this point and the quickest way through is honestly just playing things out like a standard shooter. The assault rifle, combined with the instant kill of a headshot, makes this section more or less par for the course. You can play this out by fighting and hiding since the two-handed enemies will lose track of Lara, but I wager most players won't play it out that way. So Lara doing her tomb raiding causes a supernatural flood, and the first of the Crash Bandicoot auto-scrollers of which there are four. The town will be collapsing, the village will be hunting you down, zombies will be trying to clap your ass, or an earthquake will be fucking everything up. It's all very expensive window dressing for what is essentially hog wild. You run forwards because stopping results in your death, then you move left and right, or jump, or throw the axe. Failing to respond to the visual cues causes your death in a comical fashion, and you try again. Nothing about this has anything to do with tomb raiding, nothing about this has anything to do with guerrilla warfare, everything about this is a waste of the animator's time, a waste of the coder's time, and a waste of the production time in general. It's a very expensive spectacle that gets Lara from point A to point B. Just in this first segment, we have rushing water tearing apart the nearby geometry, NPCs animated to be suffering, and this probably requires a lot of testing to make sure it worked consistently. Tell yourself that you still can. <laughs> oh, I didn't, she didn't grab the light pole! Why oh, I asked myself that. She didn't do it again! So you got plenty of time. You got all the time in the world. Oh, it? Okay, like it was sinking that time. Something you should be failing. What the fuck, lady? Fuck you. All right. What did you do? <laughs> the point is, Lara causes the catastrophe, so make it a brisk cutscene, spend far less time on it since it's a small movie that you can control how and what it is seen, and allow the player to skip it on a replay. Player input in this section hardly changes anything. It's forcing me to watch the cutscene by being interactive. No one is safe! Not if he gets the box first! I have to go! I'm the only one! You're the only one that can what? You don't know that you caused all this, Lara! Not everything is about you! These people need us here. We can do good now! Credit where credit is due, the acting here is some of the best the series has seen, and the characters are animated fairly well. But when this is par for the course for a AAA game, it's hardly anything to write home about. These two argue, and it's finally time to enter where the game began. That was like 30 minutes to get where we... that was so long. You're right. Oh my god. The intro here has Lara walking out of the crash, cold, alone, and shivering, once again arbitrarily restricting our movement until a little later on in the jungle. I'm a big fan of how much Lara's field of vision is limited and how much vegetation is laid out, but sections like these aren't used with combat. It might have been asking too much for the PS4 and Xbox One to have this level of detail with a large number of guards, but introducing areas like this only to have them fall off and not interact with the gameplay in a meaningful way is why this game makes me think wasted potential all the way through. There are many areas here to allow for ambushes, surprise attacks, and spots to utilize the stealth kills. These zones would be very tense if they were allowed to carry over to combat. But this section just allows Lara to get some craftables before she carries on to the first campfire. Not before getting interrupted by Anne running her stupid mouth, of course. Here lies our first little puzzle where Lara must acquire a makeshift knife from a plane. Of course, this has to involve a cinematic of the thing collapsing as well as a forced steel attack. Can't let that work on the EO animation go to waste, right? Once out of the water, the player's knowledge also has a small opportunity to work against them if they know Lara needs to open some crates for craftables to sharpen the knife. She won't be able to sharpen the knife at the campfire until she attempts to cut the rope. It's a little weird to not allow her to sharpen a dull plain knife she just picked up without failing to cut the rope first, but in a sea of problems, what's one more nitpick? The only way to go here is our first jaguar fight. The up-close nature of this fight will hopefully get the player comfortable with the dodge mechanic that will come back into relevancy later when Lara is again constrained to a small space with more aggressive enemy types. It's honestly the only time the mechanic really comes into focus because during casual play it's overshadowed by stealth and powerful assault weapons. Since the game does present these close quarter setups, the mechanic is probably the most relevant it's ever been. 
You can, however, get by here without ever using the dodge, and if you stop attacking the enemy, you'll see just how generous it really is, even on harder difficulties. Shit, get out of here, you uh, jagwire. Were you gonna call it a slut? Yes, you slut. <laughs> I will find it because I don't remember any of these photos, so it's gotta be a bug. Okay, so this thing is just fucking chasing me. Get out of here. What do you mean? It's a fucking leopard. What do you mean it's just fucking chasing me? God, I'm dying. Full strength. <laughs> kill that leopard. <laughs> <laughs> leopard doesn't do if you fucking attack it. Confused it. Confused it. Once the jaguar is killed, the brain teaser with the bridge and the challenge tomb are around to pad out the time until the next story segment. I will tackle all the tombs as a group later on, so for now I'll just say the placements of these tombs allows you to somewhat control your pacing, so that you're not just assaulted by back to back cutscenes. A few are actually mandatory, but the bulk of them remain optional. This first bridge, though simplistic, managed to stump a few folks I've seen play the game, though it's likely for lack of paying attention. Lara and Jonah have a conversation about what to do, and have commentary to both confirm the player is doing the right thing and assist the puzzle. Without these things, some people can actually get lost, but once the player realizes there's a lower level, it's not a big roadblock. A nice touch would have been to allow players who know the solution to perform the rope attachment on the first go if they move quickly enough. But alas, everyone will set the bridge position at least twice. So we just don't see anything? I'm back. Huh? No, we can't. No, we're what? I'm watching how she is going to solve this. I'm guessing she's on all hard. Uh, no. she is on combat normal because wow. yeah, I've already man. drank too much. Do we say your real name on stream? I mean, I don't. She's really care. Ashley. That's what you are. You're Ashley. Apparently. Is that what <laughs> just, like a stripper does? Like a, a stripper <laughs> I guess that's my stripper name. I go by Blake. <laughs> Crossing the bridge will lead us to our second jaguar fight, and the setup is just very bizarre. The single jaguar enemy in the small arena already had some issues responding to Lara's mobility, so naturally when you want to increase the difficulty of this fight, you make an expansive arena that Lara can move and jump through, give her trees to climb, give her access to craftable arrows and health, and then throw in one jaguar, which can still be dealt with in the manner that you did in the small arena. She's just been given far too much here for them to not up the number of enemies she's fighting. It's literally just one helpless animal against a spastically hopping murderer with bountiful resources cover in space. Shit's just far too much in Lara's favor for this to be the harder version of the first fight. The simple fix is to just add another jaguar. I would at least have two for the normal combat difficulties, and possibly three for the harder ones. Some that would force Lara to take advantage of the space and trees. RB is just like the... Yeah, I don't know how to do this. Oh, never mind. It might just be RT. Sorry. RB is for the uh, flame arrows. He's right. He's right. Oh, I got it. I like how he's letting you do your thing right now, though. He's being really nice. Yeah, what, what, what is this guy doing? He's letting her do her thing. Yeah. What the you fuck? Are you, good? you ready to fight? Are you for real? You cheated. You cheated. Yo. No, so don't even get close to him. Just, no, stop. He might not even attack you. Nice. That's fucking crazy. Are you gonna uh, retaliate? Dude, this thing's dumb. To claim her treasure, the adventurer Lara Croft must outwit the king, reach the forbidden tomb, and solve the mystery of the White Queen. The way will be fraught with trials. We go back to the days when Lara was an immortal playing treasure hunter in her backyard. Personally, I found the setup pretty endearing the first time around, and if they actually expanded on this more, it would make for a novel tomb. Since Lara is a child here and won't have access to her weapons, I suggest placing this towards the game's very beginning to tutorialize the tomb raiding in a safe environment. This would contextualize why there isn't combat in the first tomb the player needs to complete, and you can focus on small, easy versions of what later challenges in the game would ask of the player. You don't need to hold their hand, you can introduce concepts that the player will be using, and it could be something experienced players can zip through for a reference of how far they've come since they initially ran through the game. Well that sounds well and good game design wise, but we're still playing Shadow of the Tomb Raider. 
There's nothing inherently wrong placing a section like this where it currently is in game. It just shares the same pacing issues that new Lara was known for. Here she only needs to make it into the family treasure room. There is some experience to be gained from playing around on the equipment outside, but it's nothing mandatory. The platforming here is 100% scripted, since young Lara is unable to experience a failure state in the form of death. She'll climb, things will break, and she'll talk to herself the whole time. Climbing the roof may as well just be a cutscene, since there's nothing you can do to really fuck it up. I get that they don't want to show a child dying for missing a jump, but you can still frame the platforming in a way that's more in line with, like, platforming. New Lara's climbing segments in and out of this specific scene really just make me think how far the games have fell in this regard. A successful platformer will lay out a movement skill set for their character that is intuitive to control. The rules for controlling these characters and how they will interact with their environment is clear and consistent. Go in water, you'll swim. Touch fire, it burns you. See ledge, you grab it. Miss the angle, no magnet hands to pull you to a climbable space. So kind. Only when she has to change the settings. All right, so when you change the settings and you hit that button. No! Going miserably is in our entertainment, isn't it? Uh, oh. Whoa! Once the character's movement set is defined, you literally just play shit around for the character to jump around on in ways that actually challenges their ability. Typically increasing the difficulty by adding moving platforms, spaces that you can't remain on forever, auto-scrolling sections that aren't removing your control in one way or another, hazardous flooring, bottomless pits, asking them to collect items in hard to reach places, asking them to perform harder jumps in succession, aerial hazards, asking them to complete an area under a certain amount of time. The platforming formula has been solved many times over. Because when you go too far away from the player responsibility in platforming, you get sections like these. Like, Lara may as well just open the front door and walk into the room we're going to get to because there is no universe where she fails this climbing segment. I would say this is as surface level as game interactivity gets, but hey, the rest of the game and its predecessors also exist, now don't they? Let's go back to when the franchise was brand spanking new. Lara's movement skill set may not be for everybody, but the rules are defined and they're consistent. Lara behaves in the same fashion whether she's in her house, in China, in Egypt, floating out on some islands, in the shower, it doesn't matter. From the get-go, you get told the rules. As you go along these games, the platforming builds with the level design, which, if you know how I go about these things, is basically just as important as making your character handle correctly. Newer players will slow down in tougher spots to line up their jumps, seasoned players will move through spaces with some more confidence, and skilled players will style on these sections since they understand the movement nuances. I would say having a single segment which can be played out in a variety of ways, ways in which you can tell someone's skill level just by looking up their movement, is the mark of a good platformer. There are easy movements for players getting their feet wet, and there are risky slash harder to pull off movement options for players trying to speed up and smooth out the gameplay. Classic Tomb Raider essentially does these things, which is why to this day they're still the best platformers out of every iteration of Lara. The second trilogy is when things started to get more automated in this regard, where player control became limited to making sure Lara was jumping in the right direction. As long as you faced the right way and got close enough, you essentially got by and Lara did the rest. Compared to the days of old where the player had control over what she gripped, this is a loss of some movement nuance. This shouldn't necessarily equate to a drastically different experience since we're only saying that now Lara has a 100% chance to grip every ledge she touches. And honestly, most other platformers already work in this way. It's just how they went about it. It seems like every ledge has this field of activation, like Lara needs to enter into that field for her to begin an animation of reaching out for the ledge. This makes her movements look more natural, but the unintended effect is that you can't gauge how precise your jump has to be. To see this in full view when this property is at its strongest effect, let's watch Moonbounce Lara get sucked into a black hole. Yeah, the second trilogy was the beginning of the platforming automation, but they would at least mix things up with platforming placement and utilization of the grapple. 
The newer games may as well just be facing the right general direction and then jumping. Let's pick some harder classic jumps to illustrate the difference. So in Tomb Raider 2, one of the harder stages, the Temple of Sion, just a fantastic stage to showcase how you push Tomb Raider platforming, let's pick two segments. There's this boulder segment that requires you to react to what's on screen. While advancing, you recognize a threat, so you have to position Lara correctly for a jump before you're crushed. Execute the jump without over or under shooting it, and then you keep executing it as you move her forwards. Then there's the ladder ascension that requires you to jump, manually change what direction she is facing, followed by gripping on the other side. This is just basic shit the game platforming does. Now, if Hollywood Lara was here in the boulder segment, her superior control allows her to just tilt the control stick towards the ledge over and hit jump. Lara will auto grab the ledge, pull herself up, and then keep going. Same situation, far less effort. If this was the ladder, Lara climbs to where she needs to be, hits the jump, and propels her off the ladder, then she auto turns and grabs. Same situation, far less effort. Now Anne here will get a cutscene of the boulder falling down, which will lower the skill floor for reaction time. She says something about her dead father, she just kinda sorta jumps at the other ledge, and her magnet hands allows her to pull through. She more or less plays like Hollywood Lara, but how generously she can miss object has a random element to it. It's not inherently bad for Lara to undergo this movement tweak, she's just performing the same actions she used to much quicker. But doing these basic things in the classic games quickly required far more technical skill, which is likely what engaged the player. The level of difficulty of the jumps and what the platforms are doing in the newer games is hardly changed. The only thing that has changed is Lara herself. Hollywood had the grapple, moving platforms, and consistent challenges to try to make up for this sudden mechanical change. Platforms were also still just an extension of exploration and puzzle solving. New Lara is essentially a watered down version of the watered down version of Tomb Raider platforming. It usually just means move from point A to point B. It's filler that's not really challenging. Lara could show acrobatic mastery and skillful play like her peers when she started out. The skill floor fell as she aged and by the end point she may as well just be pressing A at the right time while holding forwards. Even when things seem elaborate, you're typically timing out your jumps then allowing Lara to do the rest. It's not as if the platforming had to get worse as the combat got better, but that seems to be the case. So, uh, young Lara, right? Proof chuckles at her audacity. <laughs> She's close now. She's inside now, because this is pretty much where her section begins. This segment relies on a simple block puzzle and light, but Lara will solve this for the player. The note said 90 degrees east and 30 north. Showcased throughout this segment are some old artifacts collected by Pop Pop. So let's play Pitch This Accurate! The Sun King, Louis XIV, married Maria Theresa a long-standing Correct! Louis XIV did indeed marry Marie Therese of Austria, daughter of King Philip IV of Spain, in order to rectify peace between their two countries. The cup of St. John. The apostle had been given a chalice of poisoned wine, but after his blessing, the poison transformed into a snake, and he drank the wine unharmed. Correct! The poison cup is an emblem of the Catholic St. John the Evangelist. The symbol stems from the popular miracle story, where hereby at John's blessing, the poison in a cup of wine intended for his consumption is transformed into a serpent. An ossuary. This box contains the bones of the dead. I can't read the inscription. Correct! The box is the final resting place for the dead. This is the kind of armor that the conquistadors wore during the Age of Discovery. Correct! A statue of an Ariki from the Cook Islands. Eh, not really sure. The design might be inspired by their style. Mm, that's about it. 25th Dynasty. The interior of the sarcophagus is incredibly intricate. Correct. That's literally exactly it. An African tribal mask made of gold. Ashanti, perhaps. Correct. 
the death mask of Agamemnon found in Mycenae. Incorrect! All designs point to this style. A Yatiri, a South American healer. Yeah, I don't know. Clothing, can't really find the clothing style. What's that, fucktard? Do you think I was gonna shoot myself? Seriously, this is your house. Why is your house so elaborate? This realistic croft. Her heart pounding, our hero crosses the threshold into the unknown. Again, the performances here are fine. It's just a shame that all of this is attached to Shadow. I don't buy for one second that the game has to let this scene play out. So let's just pretend you watched this all the way through and move on. Why not? I'll be dead more likely. No thanks. I'll keep sitting here looking for hostiles. Less talking, more looking, gentlemen. Get off your asses. Again, I'm trying to wrap my head around why I'm playing out a sequence like this in this manner. Doing anything other than what's intended here will result in Lara's death, so we're essentially in a cutscene that will not progress without our input. My guess for the why would be the time wasted creating the AI Jonah would need to have to move around in a more conventional combat sequence. So rather than waste time coding Jonah to fight alongside Lara for one segment, they just have us go through this scripted sequence instead. If you think of it that way, this scene saves development time. However, this is still putting narrative concerns over the core gameplay. We just had to have Lara and Jonah interact in combat, so the main game has to suffer to make it happen. Honestly, nothing is really lost here if we just allowed the two to advance to town. They've solved the puzzle together and talked around a campfire. We don't really need more scripted sequences to build their relationship. That was close. Yeah. How'd they know to come here? I don't know. Not exactly the civilization I was hoping to run into. Now in the first game, Jonah is just the ship cook. There's nothing really remarkable about him. If you ask me after 2013, which of Lara's sidekicks would come back for the sequel, it would easily be Sam. She's the best friend at this point in time, but rather than go the all-female route, we get this New Zealander we can cuck for the rest of our time. He isn't allowed to be as competent as his 115 pound counterpart, but he's not completely useless, though he is shamelessly used as death bait as we go along. I admire you. I do. But even my patience has limits. Tell me what you know. Now! <laughs> the relationship wasn't really clear to me initially. I don't know why Jonah would invest this much time in Lara after the survivors decided to ditch her unless he was trying to fuck her eight different ways in a night of passion. But here's the point where it's made clear that Jonah and Anne are strictly platonic. In which case, this bitch better be paying you some top dollar. We can stand here and listen to Jonah and Abby awkwardly flirt, or carry on to the shops, the main game, or some side missions. Up until this point, I've been strictly covering the main game as to try to keep the reviews in line with one another. The old games didn't really have side missions, so I ignored them for the sequels. We're gonna scrap that mentality this time and talk about all of them, because I hate myself. But before we do that, let's give the new skill tree system a quick glance since it's here that we'll probably have some points to spend. The coat of paint here is new, but we're more or less dealing with the same system with some tweaks to the unlockable skills. Each color represents a focus on either stealth, scavenging, or combat. Within those categories, skills are broken up into ones available by default, ones given to you by the story, ones given to you by challenge tombs, ones reserved for New Game Plus, and DLC. The blue skills are easily overshadowed by red and green, with green easily being the best of the three. The most useful skills in blue from the defaults are the gathering more salvage, larger ammo capacity, and price reduction at merchants. The rest don't see much viable use. There's revealing traps with survival instincts, but traps are either in plain sight, 
trigger a quick time event, or Lara just runs her mouth. You can gather arrows from looting, but all enemies drop them and they're insanely easy to craft. There's noise reduction from falls, but the AI is already crippled from stupidity. There's increased chance to find rare animals, but hunting isn't really useful unless you really want 100%. There's gathering poison for ammunition, but standard ammo really does all the jobs. You can get hearts of large animals, but these aren't of concern unless you're out for 100%. There's one that grants the normal function of highlighting everything with bat vision on higher difficulties when that's disabled. One that highlights challenge objects, taking away the challenge. And one that highlights treasures, which can be found with the smallest bit of curiosity. The story will auto-grant five more blue skills, the most out of place one being the tree kill, which falls more in line with green. The others just boost the ability of a consumable that isn't honestly that useful in combat, not when compared to the bat vision anyway. All three blues from challenge tombs are actually quite useful in stark contrast to the rest of the group. Two of them make sense for the category, one is climbing faster and the other is increasing health derived from plants. The last just improves arrow combat proficiency, so it should really go under red. The new game plus blues are just trash, altering factors that were a non-issue to begin with. Red is slightly more valuable than blue. From the defaults, a good chunk of the skill set goes towards improving arrow combat, and the ones that don't vary in their success. One allows you to upgrade weapons to their full power, which is only useful if you're bad at headshots. One lets you resist damage after healing, and resist damage after stealth kills, but the difference honestly isn't that much. The one that's out of place is the one that prevents Lara from entering the slip animation from jumps, which should probably go with blue. The story red grants fear arrows, which are the best weapons in the game, and the ability to reduce damage taken temporarily. The challenge tomb reds grant more knockback with the axes, instant healing once you're near death, and grant more power to the bow and arrow charge shot. Every skill may not be a winner, but at least the challenge tombs are providing Lara with an incentive to seek them out and complete them. The new game plus reds just reduce enemy accuracy, which is only useful on hard or deadly obsession. There's one for keeping enemies in a paralyzed state longer, which they won't frequently be in, and one that grants you damage resistance after every kill, which is the only universally valuable DLC red skill to have. Green has some duds, but it's a pretty versatile list of bangers, and it isn't focused on the bow like red. Stealth killing without the risk of alert is borderline broken. Killing two enemies silently when they're in near proximity is taking broken to new heights. Swimming underwater for longer is useful for speeding up the main game swimming sections. Combined with swimming faster, it pretty much eliminates your need for the air pockets. This is especially true after lung capacity is upgraded again with the challenge tomb reward. The lure traps are busted if you're more inclined to play with stealth, and they really shine in a specific section of the game. I suspect they're rated so low because playing shadow like Rise is pretty much valid the entire way through. Auto looting enemies killed with stealth is just a nice convenience. Lure arrows is just putting lemon juice on the wounds of the bad AI. Poison grenades abuses the bad AI and deals damage. Concussive shells replace the grenade launcher, and grenades are very useful in a pinch. Out of the defaults, I only call the flare rounds, vestige outfits, and super flare rounds duds since their functions are either performed by another better skill, or is made completely useless by the abundance of materials. The story giving greens is one game changer and one dud. Focus plants are pretty much useless, but mud is the ultimate abuse to the poor AI of the game. Without it on higher difficulties, the enemies fare better in locating Lara. When it's applied, they really just display some bizarre behavior. It's like the game forces them to drop several IQ points. Challenge Tomb Greens give quicker health regen, reduce damage from flank attempts which allow you to play whack-a-mole for longer, and further increase your time underwater. The new game plus skills continue to be a letdown, even in green. One literally lowers the enemy's ability to find you after they lose sight, but it's honestly hard to tell a difference with or without this skill, especially with mud. One makes the lure trap a bomb, but enemies already don't react to your location from the grenade launcher. The last lets you use the double stealth kill if two enemies are stunned next to each other, which is very unlikely. There's some overlap here with the skills learned in Christmas Past, but I do think shadow skills are more universally viable than Rises, only due to the fact that guerrilla warfare has been implemented giving the devs another layer of combat to work with. Everything alright? No, todo está mal como siempre. Estos... Saqueadores vienen a la ciudad. Nos contratan para desenterrar nuestras propias. The side quests can all be initiated from one of the three main hubs in the game, but the vast majority of them are located in the hidden city. 
By my count, there's eight of them, not including DLC. Only one is in our first little town here. One is in San Juan, and the other six are in the Hidden City. The ones from the DLC and their attached challenge tombs will be covered later on. The first quest for all intents and purposes is just one more firefight to count towards the game's total. There's a little bit of drama in the beginning where you speak to some NPCs, but you get the waypoint, you show up to the area, and then you kill the men. This is mainly adding on to more content towards the game's main mechanics, so I'll call it a win in that regard. But this section is just another small arena. You've already been over how this is an idea for the guerrilla warfare since the enclosed space will more or less cause the scenario to play like Rise. <sighs> But at least there's not much scripted filler here. Next, we have to find a young brother's dice set he lost to the local gang across town. This quest is entirely centered around finding people and talking to them. Just run your ass from waypoint to waypoint and talk to people who don't speak your language. Since the main game doesn't really require you to explore much of the hidden city, it's a good way to get the player to familiarize themselves with the landscape and look around. Without the side quests, the only other things these hubs are good for is supplies, costumes, and weapon upgrades. None of it is really mandatory as even on the hardest difficulties, the base unupgraded weaponry is good enough to carry the fights. Having more ammunition and damage is really just a nicety for lower skilled players. The roster of guns and clothing maintenance will give the money you find some mileage, but that's only if you bother to actually pay attention to the items sold at the shops. The Hearts and Minds side quest is a three parts affair. The first is simple enough, requiring you to free a captured NPC, which begins the game's nonsensical trend of rescuing people from the Serpent Guard. Several people in the city require saving, but once they've been rescued, they make no effort to skip town. In fact, these niggas just go back to their homes like, shit, I was just in jail, ain't no thing. The Serpent Guard is intertwined with the town, and if the captives were pursued once, why on earth would they not assume that they'll just be pursued again? In fact, you can save certain members tied to poles, and if you leave the area and come back, they'll just be tied to the same pole again. Like, Come on, what the fuck did you think would happen? That you just violate the law and they'd say, mm, Well, okay, I guess we'll just give up. There's no fear with these people. There's no sense of urgency. There's no plan to escape. It's just, well, we were free. We're safe now. So diverse, yes? The second part of the quest has you going into a crypt, which involves a strongest use of finger quotes puzzle with water level. This takes place in a cistern. Unfortunately for Shadow, having a cistern with water level mechanics will cause my brain to invite a comparison to the original cistern and its modern counterpart. The original cistern was a proper dungeon in the mid game. It only spanned a few rooms, but you were asked to learn the layout and adjust the water level accordingly from a certain spot. Until you had three keys, you were essentially dungeon crawling and having awkward gunfights with Pierre Dupont. This is nothing but straight gameplay, which hits on all the core mechanics. Platforming, puzzle solving, and combat. The modern counterpart is a less intense version of this, with the combat mostly stripped out. But there is still a thinking component here, and an effort to capitalize off the game's platforming mechanics. Here, Lara falls down a hole and she swims to four corners to hit a switch that raises the water level. The hardest thing here is figuring out how to exit the later spots where the levers are located, which to say it's not very hard. Crypts are technically separated in category from tombs in that they're less puzzle intensive, but it's still just so base. This may as well be Tomb Raider Legend in the section after the bike chase. Just swim to the four glowing objects and press the buttons. But in that game, there were more puzzles and platforming challenges afterward. Here, this is the entire section of gameplay. Cistern. The last part of this quest is just another Jaguar fight. A single animal is pitted against a psychopath in an arena that's far too spacious for it to pose a real threat. This animal somehow has armor for some reason, which forces Lara to attack it from behind. Despite the limited angle of attack, you can dodge in the same manner as the leopard fights to beat the enemy. Also, for whatever reason, Lara opts to not use her more powerful firearms in this fight. 
which is also the start of an annoying trend where Lara arbitrarily locks off part of her arsenal. There's no reason to limit yourself when a raging animal is actively trying to fuck you every direction. Screw your weird culture, or whatever nonsense tradition this is, this is a fight, use your gun. This animal is trying to kill you. It's not even like the guy said not to use weapon. Hey, why even use the bow? Why not just wrestle it? Why not fight it with a hand tied behind your back? Why not just lie down, spread your legs, and the freedom quest begins with you saving four natives tied to poles. Sure, buddy. The second part of the quest is the firefight against the serpent guard, and another case of dumb bitch syndrome. Lyra's going to murder all of these men, and instead of using her automatic weapons and superior firepower, she just arbitrarily restricts her arsenal down to the bow and arrow for no reason. Uh, again. The end result is the same, I mean all the men die, so why make it this hard on yourself? What do you have to gain by engaging the enemies in this way? In fact, she outright uses her entire arsenal against the Serpent Guard later on. The fight is only difficult on the higher settings due to the arbitrary weapon restriction. Granted, the lack of firepower and cover makes this one of the more unique arena fights since the guard is usually found with access to hiding places, but the endgame logic to get here makes no sense. Widow's Tears? Okay. Widow's Tears is a murder mystery side quest which is more about dialoguing with NPCs and navigating the map. Let's just make sure we're on the same page here. Lara cannot perform this mission without the Serpent Guard outfit. Outfit. Fuck me, dude. If she is not perceived as one of them, the game will prevent you from doing this mission. Mid-mission, you can scrap the outfit entirely and interact with your sworn enemies of the main game. Reminder that these guys are actively hunting her for all of her bullshit. So not only is Lara not disguised, we also have this English-speaking white woman just working a case. Is working a case. Cistern, these people do not speak your language and you do not speak theirs. It should kind of tip them off that something is wrong when they talk to you. The writers can't get around this problem and they don't care to. Wouldn't care in any other instance that the gameplay was king, but that isn't the case with new Lara. We're just expected to hand wave this stuff and keep paying writers to not solve these problems. Just accept it how it is. This issue is a persisting problem from earlier in the main game when you first get the outfit. Innocent eyes will blink at dawn when weakness falls away. Innocent eyes will blink at dawn when weakness falls away. I'm like, who is this person? <laughs> what? <clears throat> and Lara gave the password. Yeah. But the level of stupid here is just off the charts for the side quest. This doesn't function narratively for your narrative driven game. And that's just kind of where we are. Stay of Execution is another nonsensical savior type quest. Lara frees a man who will remain in the city as if being saved in this instance will cover him for the rest of his life. There's zero work done to clear the man's name of any crime, which placed him in the situation where at least in the last quest, Lara found and caught a murderer that the suspect was taking the blame for. When your writing makes less sense than a quest that's fundamentally broken on a narrative level, you're making too much money for your job. Ancient Study stars a girl fascinated with the Serpent Guard. You head to three waypoints to read murals, then head to the waypoint to kill the guards to stop the little girl from being sacrificed by her shitty father. Laura will once again not use firearms to save the life of a little girl, and the family will make no effort to leave town once they're out of harm's way. Their Serpent Guard has not been dismantled, and presumably they will attempt to kidnap this child again. Y'all need to leave town! Starcrossed is the one and only mission in San Juan, not including DLC. The beginning with a vague task of investigating the cemetery begins promisingly enough. 
At the very least, new Lara is shown to try and help the locals. I mean, I much prefer the sophisticated selfish asshole that was in it for the game and the prize that she wanted, cause at least then she wasn't a huge hypocrite bouncing between a rampaging murder psychopath that slaughters hundreds to caring about the kids. Once the children's riddle is solved and you give them some garbage, you follow a path that crosses to another crypt which won't really require much critical thinking. You just enter, discover a wounded girl, and then platform out to inform her family. Then they tell you about an actual tomb out in the play area, but we'll get to that one later. Laura, I... What? Abby said not to break anything. I'm not breaking it. I'm restoring the original. Well, we're finally off to our first tomb! Proper. To make it there, we need to kill some men with the magic of mud. Up until this point, Lara has acquired this status automatically, but now we can officially utilize it at will in combat when it's provided. Regardless of difficulty, this is a game-breaking tool since the AI is already pretty stupid, and this will only make their willingness to ignore Lara that much more. But in all honesty, going gung-ho with the assault rifle is a quick and effective method. By this point, the player likely knows how threatening the enemies are from the previous encounter, and the dip in difficulty here should be a cakewalk for most. The first puzzle here is a simple observation. Lara just needs to rotate the pillars to match the symbols on the walls before hitting the center door button. If she does this wrong, there's like a bunch of snakes just, just hanging out in an enclosed pit. Alive. Just cuz. Though there are five layers total, there's really only four steps, since Lara simply calls Jonah for the answer to the final layer. The game will encourage you to check your notes, but it's not really required to solve. Once you're done rotating columns, you're pretty much done, continuing the new Lara trend of having pitiful excuses for tombs. To make our way out is a little exercise in swimming in stealth. There's only one path to leave this space, heading to the left, and if the player stays on the corridor path, they can make their escape with some patience. Water is hardly used in the game, the only sections requiring swimming being connective tunnels to allow areas to load, a few ponds, and some crypts. The piranhas are also hardly used, only on the main path a few times, two tombs, and in some crypts. Sometimes to create this scenario of hide and seek, and others to keep Lara from swimming to solutions. It gamifies swimming from point A to point B, but for how little these fish are used, I can't say the trade-off in time like we spent making these things was really worth it. Following our swim is one of the arena shooter setups with the Trinity Soldiers. We begin with the game forcing us to use the skill gain from the tomb, but without some more legwork from the AI, level design, and some tweaks to Lara, the Eagle's Talon is essentially a throwaway skill. Lara was too well armed and hits too hard. The enemies are far too stupid, and the spaces where enemies are encountered are far too small for players to choose to actively use this. To make this more attractive, I'd either have more ammo scarcity or have far more punishing consequences for breaking from stealth. As it stands now, it's putting in a lot of effort to make one kill that can actually get you killed if you're discovered while performing this action. Mara will play through the whole animation whether or not enemies are oblivious to her, or she's actively being attacked. This is anecdotal, but neither myself nor anyone I watched decided to use this option despite the level design encouraging it here. The space starts off with all variants from handgun enemies to fully armored soldiers and essentially plays like a section from Rise. The reason this fight is easier is because the enemies can lose track of Lara. It's made even easier if the player knows to eliminate the handgun enemies first. This is standard fare at this point, so let's move on. Now it's time to hit up the main hub world, but first we'll have to get there. A swimming segment is used here to let the game load in its next assets, and once back on land, some light platforming on the linear path will lead Lara to the next main tomb. According to the devs, the Trial of the Eagle was formerly an optional challenge, but they felt it was good enough for mandatory inclusion. Despite its initial appearance, this is still a huge downgrade from the dungeon crawling of the good old days. The cluttered nature goes some way towards hiding exactly where Lara is supposed to go next, but she'll still open her mouth to nudge the player in the right direction despite difficulty. The platforming here finally begins leaning towards the LAU side, requiring Lara to at least react to the climbable surfaces after making a jump and timing when she'll make the next ascent. Other than that, the extent of the platforming is still just recognizing where you can jump next and following the path along. 
The only reason someone would struggle here is if the clutter throws them off, or if they forget Lara can lower herself from the pickaxe walls with the rope. The puzzle aspect of the room tomb comes from figuring out how to extend sails in the center of the room with the rope attachment. The easiest variant is introduced with a straightforward open hole and a rotating pole. You shoot a rope arrow at the center near the pole because that's what you've been trained to do when you see rope for the last two games, and then you ascend to the next portion. Unfortunately, the next portion is the full extent of the puzzle's difficulty. To attach a rope to the center from this section, you need to hold open a door that will attempt to close itself. To do this, you attach its connection point to a second pole conveniently located nearby before repeating the process of attaching the center sail to the rotating pole. This stuff looks pretty elaborate, but in terms of difficulty, you're really not doing much more than you were doing in the Rise puzzle rooms, and barely anything more in the 2013 rooms. The only thing that's really gone up here is the presentation value, so basically we're spending more money to achieve the same caliber of engagement from the player. See, once this point is passed, it's a straight up platforming challenge that will require more waiting than platforming. And nothing is complete with new Lara unless some shit's breaking to artificially up the tension. Once you're past that, it's hopping across some pillars with the gamified elements to them stripped out. According to the devs, the reason these hanging poles came in batches was because you were supposed to determine the correct one to jump on before proceeding. Wow. That took us so long to tweak and, <laughs> <laughs> and make playable. <laughs> Remember when there was a puzzle you needed to like know oh, yeah. exactly which keepu to jump on right, based on a color, number? There was a color combination of yeah. keepus, you had to get there, and no one understood that, they kept dying. Too many people failed this in testing, so instead you not only need to time your A presses correctly. This puzzle concept of just choosing the right platform to engage with isn't anything new. All you need is context clues to make it function, like here in this example, the platforms are set around astrology, and determining the right one comes from picking the sign that actually exists from the fake. If you don't know the signs, the surrounding area has them all displayed, and as you ascend, the relevant signs are in view to help you out until the very last platform. This was achieved on the Nintendo 64, but I guess this is now asking too much of people nowadays. Delora dies into the outskirts of the hidden city, and we move on. I'm glad you're safe. Say, if you had to guess who would be leading a primitive city where living conditions aren't modernized, and you said a woman, you'd be right. It's okay though, man. Once she dies, you'll be following a little boy instead. A strong female leader takes us under her wing after some questioning, and Jonah has kept us a bargaining chip while us adults plot how to stop Trinity. Pretty nice place. Quiet. This is the point of the game where the pacing gains the most improvement. There's a few side quests to do, potentially some tombs to go back to and complete, some crypts to plunge, and some equipment upgrading to accomplish if the player chooses to. For 100% completionists, you were likely doing the challenge tombs and crypts as you went along, but still, credit where credit is due. You have some potential variation on what to do next. I mean, the side quests aren't anything special, make no narrative sense, and the weapon upgrades are entirely pointless, but hey, the options are still there. That's a start. We get to... Walk slowly behind strong woman, taking in the sights before we get properly introduced to the Serpent Guard. Directly after is our third mandatory tomb, so at least we've learned not to tend towards back-to-back -to -back firefighting in this motherfucker. There's a very brisk platforming section to enter this tomb, but we quickly devolve from a one-root linear path to a one-root linear path that we have to watch Lara slowly traverse and commentate through. This tomb's entrance is the introduction to the concept of setting fire to a trail of oil, and the following room is as far as the concept will go. There's a wooden blockade just like the entrance, and there's two circular plates that need their trails lined up so that we can burn fire down the path. It may seem a little daunting for those not keen on the puzzles, since one plate can only be rotated by attaching rope and spinning another but it really just comes down to lining up the second plate before the first, since that one can be moved independently. Once you line them up and burn down the path, that's basically it. 
Tomb done. Mission accomplished. Lara gets a silver box that's going to somehow play a role in stopping the supernatural event she's initiated by having her savior complex. Once we leave the tomb, we enter our second of four Crash Bandicoot sections. Lara just needs to move forward, avoid oncoming obstacles, and make a few jumps. Again, all this commotion looks like it took a lot of time and work for something that's not really intertwined with the core mechanics. Lara is made for free roaming exploration, shooting, and puzzle solving. Pulling her into these mediocre running sections just seems like a baffling waste of development time. There's still two more of these to go as well, each ramping up the expense. The game I've best seen handle a dramatically shifting landscape while still maintaining the quality of its platforming were the newer 2D Rayman games, which had this stuff nailed down to a T. Despite how much is going on, you're still doing exactly what the game was built for. The spectacle is just another way to present challenges relevant to the core gameplay. Here in the next two sections is just Lara running forward and jumping dead ahead. The best of these would have to be the mudslide, where at least the rope axe is utilized, but from the looks of how much is going on here, the juice is not worth the squeeze. We're playing Tomb Raider, not Crash Cucks the Last of the Mohicans. To add on to this section, the Serpent Guard interaction with Lara here still makes no sense. The chase ends in the city that the guard occupies. One has killed himself trying to catch Lara, but when she leaves this hole, none of them fucking care even if she appears in front of them. I get that the guard is kind of sectioned off in a different part of town, but they still occupy this city like everybody else. It's not like the tribesmen are openly hostile to the guard. They're stated to be feuding, but the guards get by. There's no reason why, after potentially making this life or death effort to catch this girl, that she should be walking out and about potentially just able to buy items, trade furs, pass by and say hello, Everything involving these people does not function narratively. But we'll ignore that for now. It's time to enter the mountain temple because we're gonna do something with this box that we just stole. This portion is a slightly more intensive version of the initial path to get to the first tomb since the options for cover here are limited. But our opponent is just a serpent guard who only have clubs, bows, and arrows. See, this time, Lara decided it was okay for her to utilize her full arsenal. But thankfully, at the very least, this group of enemies do not miraculously drop ammo for her high-powered weapons. They just save that for later on. Before they break this mold, the lack of ammo presents a small trade-off where you can choose your use of modern firearms, but risk running out of ammo until your next conflict with Trinity. This small detail actually goes towards improving replayability since you can work the ammo management side of things in advance, planning out when it's wise to use your modern weapons or fall back harder on the bow. Unfortunately for the guard, their AI shares tendencies with standard Trinity soldiers. The long-range attackers will fail to pose the threat if all the melee enemies are dealt with first, and since this space opens up towards the end, this makes for a scenario which gets easier as you go along. The ability for Lara to hit and run is key for the guerrilla warfare style of combat to work, and I think some aspects about the setup here are correct. There's enough space given the enemy count, but despite this, the AI essentially forces a dichotomy between a straight up cover based shooter and a broken stealth section. On harder difficulties, alerting the guard will send a barrage after you which is a good response, but this will primarily consist of the melee enemies. If those are taken out, then Lara can easily run away and make a mockery of the remainder of the guard. So on the one hand, you're playing a cover based shooter with very aggressive close range threats that can't be shaken. If you try to evade them, you're almost certainly running in the line of sight of another enemy since this map offers no cover besides the buildings. This behavior more or less mirrors Rise of the Tomb Raider, so the sound response here is to take cover and eliminate the immediate threat, which will mainly consist of the melee enemies. On the other hand, because the game threw all of its aggressive enemies at you to be slaughtered first, you instantly transition to playing a stealth game where the AI are just too stupid to live. The only way this dichotomy is avoided is if the player successfully kills all the enemies without giving away their position, but given the head coverings of the guard, I say that's unlikely for most first timers. I would say the guard AI is better than Trinity's, if only slightly, but they need more tweaking for an area with a lot of space. During this horror ordeal, a strong female was captured, so we're heading out the back to pursue the box which we lost some time in between the last two and now. Hopping to the center island is pretty much standard fair new Lara platforming, and sadly it's the best these games do at utilizing that side of her skill set. 
The reason she had these mechanics to begin with was to facilitate exploration, and this was true up until 2013 where it's been boiled down as a means for Lara to trek from point A to point B. Going from LAU to now, she hasn't really lost much, but the level design between these two generations is just a night and day comparison. One builds open-ended levels that utilizes the movement toolkit in a variety of ways to facilitate Tomb Raider, a person who raids tomb. The other just says, hey, Laura needs to be over there now. Here, just jump on some shit to get to your waypoint. And it's basically the same thing, right? This is like what someone very misinformed thinks the platforming in LAU was, but it's the same company. Getting to the center aisle and swimming through some caves leads us to a massive drop, the only one of its kind, which is again pulling out some more time for animators to make this pose. We swim some more and have the option to break with an optional tomb or carry on with the main story. We're still going with the main story. This is where Lara is handed the shotgun, carrying on the time old tradition of the game handing you significant weapons. This is technically done with the rifle initially as well, but that's moments before the first town where you can get into the arsenal and begin upgrading. The only thing this pacing with weapons really has over Legend and Underworld is that the developers can artificially control Lara's damage output for certain parts, versus just having her find a single secondary on the fly, or choosing the power weapon from the start. In theory, this could allow for the threat to scale more naturally having earlier firefights with smaller numbers when Lara only has the bow, then scaling up the sizes of the mobs when she finally gets fully automatic weapons. But here, the shotgun is the only weapon missing, and it's bizarre that they even decided to do this in a game where Lara basically starts out fully equipped. Like, a shotgun is equally as obnoxious as the fully automatic assault rifle in the portions of Guerrilla Warfare, so you might as well just give her the full tool set for this one. The reason the shotgun had to be handed out here is due to the introduction of the evil natives. Until we find out they're not evil. Hey, if you had to guess who's leading this army of all male natives to their death by psychopath, and you said the one woman, you'd be right. We're so progressive that the only enemies new Lara can never seem to kill are men, and the only time females are introduced is to be in charge of shit or act as a martyr. Not like those barbaric shooters of the past, which pretty much just had an equal sex spread for the enemies. Nitpick whining aside, the enemies are basically of the melee variety, with a few of them opting for long range attacks, though those ones remain stationary. The tactics used in the Jaguar fight are properly elevated in difficulty here, and this is the only time you're cramped in a very small space with a high number of aggro melee enemies. So as a one-off scenario, eh. Meh, it's alright. Following the fight is the next mandatory tomb, and despite its simplistic setup, it seems to present a consistent roadblock for players. At least anecdotally. It stems from having to use the waterway as a path to ascend to the top level to begin flow. Once that's worked, it's pretty easy to grasp that you need to move both waterways on the water wheels to advance. This tomb is one of the few that actually houses combat in between the puzzle. The format usually being that Lara will activate something significant, and the enemies will come in to slow down the pace of completion. It's a tried and true video game formula, which will extend the length of time new Lara will spend in this room. Because once we leave the room, the puzzle's over, and it's time for Crash Bandicoot section number three. Past this is some more platforming to hit the next waypoint where we recover the ability to climb up slanted walls. Of course, if you ever forget, the game will never fail to remind you how to play the game you've been playing for potentially eight hours now. The fact that these hint texts in the lower right or these obnoxious on-screen text explanations never stop is a nitpick problem for veteran players who don't need their hand held in this regard. An option to shut them off would be nice, but in terms of Shadow's problems, it's definitely on the less important side of the scale. <sighs> Returning to the city, it's now time to disguise ourselves to help save strong female who was captured earlier. The guard hasn't been shown to be the brightest bunch, failing to pursue a woman in the city despite having numbers and mass, allowing prisoners they've taken to live carefree right in plain sight, not realizing they're speaking to outsiders when they don't use their native tongue, and failing to recognize and capture the child of the woman in charge. Nah, we're just gonna walk in, talk to him, get by, and pursue our target. This platforming section is par for the course as we only need to make it to strong female through the mandatory scripted path. 
but it's also the one that revealed more of the nuts and bolts regarding the platforming's ties to other elements. See, as Lara goes along sections, it's not usually as simplistic as the LAU days where the obstacle just exists for Lara's traversal. Stuff breaks, Lara commentates, custom animations play, and people are spawned depending on what section of platforming is being done. The reason the speedrun of this game is so impressive is because of how many dead ends can be hit if you manage to do even the smallest sections out of order. Here, Lara's goal is just the prison room, which is directly across the river. If you manage to find a way past the guards who won't aggro for deliberately breaking their rules, you'll find that the prison cell is completely empty. In order to get strong female to spawn, the platforming must be done in order. Specifically, Lara has to commentate about the wall breaking. She has to shimmy by the two guards who will only spawn if she has pickaxed the wall earlier. Then she needs to listen to their commentary, and then she has to talk to Jonah while climbing up the wall. Then the lady will be available for rescuing. If you're not a speedrunner, this is how you're going to be forced to advance anyway, but it was interesting to learn just how much the game relies on Lara doing exactly what the devs intended. Once this chick is freed, we engage in a scripted kill sequence. It's really just beating a dead horse wondering why things are laid out like this, but I truly do wonder why they think confining the mechanics like this is a good idea. The game is basically playing itself. Proceeding inside, strong female beats a man in hand-to-hand -hand combat who has the height advantage, weight advantage, and was able to alert other guards before proceeding to lose. Then she gets a disguise and we follow her through another impressive waste of money and resources for a section we ultimately walk through. How is no one noticing her right now? <laughs> yeah. We should have had a failsafe where if you were not wearing the right costume, we'd just like auto-kill you. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, they cut out every other walk and talk, but not this one. That's weird. But I really enjoy this one. And think the pain that went through for all those feathers on, <laughs> on the mask to get through all the people. Yeah. A lot of time and work went into, like, look, I'm looking right now. Does a feather go through anybody's head? I really am furiously beating this horse, aren't I? But shit like this just really forces me to repeat it. Just look how much the team is wasting time and resources on a section you'll ultimately want to skip, especially on any type of repeat playthrough. Like if they just found a way to make scenes like this mandatory on round one, but had a way for the player to bypass this stuff on repeat playthroughs, it'd really go a long way towards improving the game's replayability. Anyway, in order to advance, we now need to speak the password again. And instead of allowing the woman who speaks the native tongue of the Serpent Guard, Ann Coulter opens her dumbass mouth again, and it just works. Lara talks to Jonah about being at the entrance of the Emperor's tomb, but really the only thing to do here is to send up this idol to initiate Strong Female's death cutscene. After she's dead, it's another small arena firefighting scenario with the Serpent Guard. In terms of the difficulty, we're talking about enemies who lack automatic weapons like Trinity, and she still has access to her full arsenal. Also, the guard now miraculously drops ammo for her modern weapons, so we're still pretty much par for the course in terms of new Lara combat. It's not as egregious as before, but they shouldn't be hanging on a fucking 223 Remingtons. Christ. All that. <laughs> Anne would be dead here again, but moving on. Hey man, you, you caught the girl you've been actively trying to murder that slaughtered hundreds, more likely thousands of your men. 
you've got an automatic weapon and you have her at gunpoint. Do you A, take a breath, aim down your sight, secure the kill, and become the hero your regiment needed, possibly even moving up a few ranks? Or B, close the gap between you and the hostile target so they have a chance to defend themselves? Don't move. Don't try me. She is gonna fuck him up. You <laughs> Should have gone with A. This portion of the game carries on the old Croft tradition of stripping Lara of her arsenal. There's probably something in the water, maybe Anne caught some brain prions or something, but she's now suddenly too stupid to rearm herself despite the abundance of firearms that the nearby enemies drop. In fact, the one she just killed had a firearm, but I guess she's gonna opt for stealth. It's most likely here that the player will learn just how poor the AI handles Lara and stealth, as the game is now actively encouraging Lara to hit and run. Before she can move on from this initial section, she has to KO all the guards in the immediate area which will be done by using smoke bombs. The majority of the men here are operating on the two-handed AI type, so if Lara KOs all the melee slash sidearm enemies first, then getting the rest is easy enough. Advancing up the river, the game will heavily encourage certain type of kills to be made, and if you play along, it's no problem making it to the campfire. Once again, Jonah will be used as death bait, and mean old Trinity Man will use him to taunt Lara to get under her skin. Post campfire, the enemies will now have thermal goggles, and the game claims that this improves the vision of these two-handed enemy types. In terms of actual performance, there's really not much difference since most cover in these sections isn't just bushes, which is the only type of cover these goggles claim to assist with. In the following sections, cover mainly consists of actual walls and solid objects which the goggles can't penetrate. So for all intents and purposes, you're doing the same thing you would have done otherwise. Here, Lara just needs to slip through this wall while being in a state of undetected, but after the initial section, you'd be forgiven for thinking that everyone needs to die. I mean, she's been doing this since college at this point, so fuck it. Why not? The next bank has the same conditions of hitting the goal while being undetected, but enemy placement will ensure you engage with the group at least once. As one-off stealth sections, this whole scenario really only undermines the rest of the game if the player realizes that the AI is clinically retarded. Watching others of my anecdotal sessions, the AI wasn't really questioned. In fact, it's just accepted that this is just how shit works. And due to the small scale of these sections, the first time player, including myself, was just going by and securing the kill in the most efficient manner they can manage. Fixing this portion would require some tweaks to the AI and level design. The enemies don't have to be this imbecilic, and to help compensate for the AI, Lara could be given more places to hide. I would add in more sections that the thermal goggles could penetrate so Lara has to plan around what enemies she can kill without the risk of being spotted. As it stands now, the first section can easily be cheesed with smoke bombs, the second section hands you the kills, and the third and fourth section can be adequately handled by Lara running away. Sometimes it works, but the other times the guards are committing suicide. After this, Lara will gain back her weakest projectile weapon and a mod which elevates it in stealth situations. Fear arrows are literally just broken, and thankfully the game wisely restricts you to three regardless of ammo capacity upgrades. Hitting any form of any armored target with them on any point of their body will cause them to attack their nearby teammates with varying success. Usually they'll end up killing two to three if they're in range, and with the last few firefights grouping large clumps of men together in the same space, these are an insanely powerful get out of county jail free card. These arrows just win fights. So it was very wise of them to restrict them to a cap of three and make their crafting materials harder to come by. Once you kill the first group with fear arrows as the game forces you to use them, the section branches off into two trails. Once again, the only criteria for moving on is arriving at the wall crack in a state of undetected. This is probably the best section of Guerrilla Warfare gameplay Shadow has to offer, mainly due to the fact that the player has some options on how to advance. Fear arrows, smoke bombs, object destruction, vertical space, as well as room to retreat and maneuver around Trinity. Power is also significantly reduced, the enemies have thermal vision, and they can take more hits since they're all armored. 
The setup honestly should have been what was going on for the game's tutorial stages, and it's at this point where we should be doing a far more complex version of this thing. But sadly, it's really all over the place on the type of game it wants to be. And sadly, not developing on any concepts introduced is par for the course. The style section ends with a loud, in-your-face, expensive-to-produce Crash Bandicoot chase segment. Moving on. Anyway, Lara now embraces her full psychopath, kills everyone, and blows a helicopter out of the sky by shooting the red barrels. If the player thinks they only have to shoot the aircraft itself, they're in for a long fight. But they catch your eye since enemies are placed near them, and most folks I've seen, including myself, seem to automatically shoot them due to how much fire Lara is under. So even though the player may not know why they won the fight, they're poised to pretty much win the fight. So what, am I supposed to feel sorry for this cunt? Yeah, keep it moving. I'm making everything worse. <laughs> so, Jonah and Abby's side plot has advanced. But fuck them, we're finally in Mexico. The last area before we can finally stop talking about this game. Praise Jesus, praise Black Jesus. Praise the Bhagavad Gita, for real. Look at this, fuck this. This is not a sustainable type of video. So we get to Mexico, and the weirdest thing is just how little of it we actually need to explore for completion. There's hunting grounds, crypts, and challenge tombs out there, but absolutely none of it is required. So this is one of the better areas for breaking up the pacing if you were getting a little exhausted from. We're going to press on to the church, however, where Jonah will mention a future puzzle item. What about you? Did you find anything? I got a pamphlet. Seven steps closer to God. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe it'll help. Don't worry, if you forget about this line, the game will kindly rob you of the solution by reminding you about Chekhov's pamphlet. We have to make it to that puzzle first, so it's searching around a house for three key points of interest while our movement speed is arbitrarily restricted. There's nothing really remarkable about discovering the hole in the wall and using Jonah to slowly climb up some mirrors to progress the light puzzle. The real brain teaser begins in this room here where Lara must face the mirror at the right corridor. Death by Spike is implied by the cutscene preceding the section, so Lara must choose right, lest she be penetrated by something other than the long dick of Square Enix and Crystal Dynamics' massive hard-on for ruining her franchise. The right one can be determined by dialogue cues alone. The following light puzzle is solved by use of the pamphlet, and thus the mandatory puzzles are now concluded. All self-contained, the majority player character assisted, and few that take from concepts introduced in earlier puzzles. If they were mainly going to be in these one-off rooms that did not expand on anything, they might as well have been optional, because that's how they're treated. The benefit of making something mandatory is that once you make a player go through something, you can then make a more complex version of that same concept later on. Using carts to weigh objects never comes back. The calendar symbols and matching plates don't come back, Making flammable oil paths don't come back. The only thing that makes some type of return is using water to make objects active and light sources. But these only return in optional tombs. The calendar symbol comes back as well, but it's not until the DLC. Solving our final mandatory puzzle naturally triggers some heptic escape sequence where we get out at the last possible minute and we trigger our penultimate set of firefights. The first is in this small contained space, which is surprisingly difficult given the AI type in front of us, but this is only achieved because the area is very compact and cover is very limited. This is essentially playing Rise, but if the player has fear arrows then this section is a joke. The area after this is a typical arena. The main difference here is that all the enemies are armored, but again, this isn't much of an issue with fear arrows. 
Even without, there's enough space here to work the scene like a typical third-person cover-based shooter. Hopping the fence is a more open area where Lara can use some guerrilla warfare tactics, and the abundance of cover combined with the two-handed AI types makes for some of the most hilarious displays of broken NPCs. It can't really be stressed enough that these men are not equipped to deal with the slightest bit of stealth. As long as you don't get cornered in the beginning, your victory is nigh guaranteed. The second part of the cornfields reduce cover and aggro the enemies to your location. So you end the penultimate combat section in typical third-person shooter fashion. After that, we get Jonah saying more stupid shit. What the hell were you thinking? If I was you, it would have worked. Honestly, I, I don't know how down to earth everyone's capabilities are, but no, Jonah, you should have had this. Especially if you're gonna voluntarily follow this girl around. You should be somewhat combat capable. You go left. I'll take these guys. What oh, okay. Fight. Yuts. So, we're just about ready to begin the final assault to the last boss. But first, guess what we have to do? Your Highness. Lara. Where, where's the box? Amaru has it. But the death of the sun draws near. We'll get it back before he completes the ritual. Holy <laughs> shit! This will not be Is it finally time to confront the final boss? To adjust the plan. Like, fuck, really? Well, okay, if you're finally the ready and all. The game will alert you that there's no coming back from the last mission. So if your goal is to 100% the game, here's where you'd save and get sidetracked before wrapping this up. The section leading up to the boss is pretty par for the course. It's a linear progression as things around you blow over, blow up, or break apart. It's a big spectacle covering up the fact that the platforming is very basic and the shooting has devolved into a standard third person cover based affair. Fortunately for Shadow, it one-ups Rise's witch fight and sets its final boss as the new best boss for the franchise. I mean, the bar isn't very high, but this fight is doing its damnedest to incorporate the core gameplay into this confrontation. Lara has a single powerful target that she has to attack, and the enemy is fairly agile, so it invokes the combat skills learned from the animals and zombies should she opt for close quarters. Other enemies will begin populating the space, but there's access to mud, trees, and cover to allow Lara to slow down the pace of the fight should she need to. This is invoking the guerrilla warfare aspect of combat. The fight begins with the main target and vulnerable, and Lara needs to deactivate his defenses before damage can be dealt. This is lightly hitting on the puzzle solving aspect. Nothing about it is super deep, but coming from a finale event that was done with a QTE, and a second finale event done in a scripted sequence, this this is the first time we actually directly kill the main boss using the tools and mechanics we've been using the entire game, which should really just be par for the course. Competing against what came before it, this adherence to basic boss design places this fight squarely at the top of the Tomb Raider's boss list. Natla, the dragon, and the spider are all dealt with in-game mechanics as well, but the lack of Lara's ability to aim means that as long as you simply position yourself and have the right weapon, you'll get the job done. It's essentially fought the same as a common enemy, it just has a lot of health. The God of Death is only focused on the platforming aspect, which is definitely the classic game's stronger suit in terms of gameplay. The fight in Angel has part of Shadow's final boss setup, with things the player must interact with before dealing damage. And at this point, this is the most complex a boss has ever been. Legend is a firefight, 
Anniversary utilizes the bullet time function, but basically retreads the first game's fight. Granted, it's much more difficult. Underworld is just a platforming segment. 2013 asks you to hit buttons. Rise's helicopter fight has some shit with timing shots to damage a large aircraft, but this is mainly focused on its cover based shooting. The fights which draw most of Lara's skill set would have to be the final boss of Angel of Darkness, the DLC Witch Fight in Rise, and finally Shadow, which is weirdly acting like a coherent game here. The fight really shines on higher difficulties when running out in the open can't be easily sustained. I found a way to cheese it with the tree, but it's still a risky play if you mess up the movement. The boss has enough health and assistance from other enemies to potentially exhaust your resources and bring you down to arrows. Other enemies running around is usually just a cheap trick to artificially inflame difficulty, as it is in 2013, but here it's a more natural fit. In 2013, the last enemy was a copy-paste of a mid-boss, which is easily dispatched of by timing your dodges and striking the enemy's backside. To increase difficulty, you're placed in a small arena, and more islanders attack you to compensate that the main enemy you're fighting is just a copy-paste with more health. The fight would otherwise play out exactly the same, so the islanders just force your attention away from the main target. Here, part of the same criticism is true. The other enemies are there to increase the difficulty, but with access to space, Lara can actually choose to focus on her target since you can use cover to lose the scrubs. This means that you can choose to hit the boss hard with your automatic weapons, dip back into hiding, and pick off the scrubs with arrows since you can keep crafting them over the span of the fight. But honestly, the approach is purely up to the player. Just the little additions of space, and the AI not constantly assaulting you at all times, makes the multi-enemy boss setup here come off as far less cheap. This boss is definitely one thing Shadow gets right. And we're talking about optional tombs. And for once, let's end Tomb Raider by talking about what should be the main focus, the tombs. We're gonna cover everything we've missed, so let's hop to it. You and me both, pal. One of the other choices with these side tombs is how the game will blatantly tell you when one's nearby in fear of that you'll miss it, despite other in-game cues to the location. For starters, there's a subtle audio cue whenever you're close to one. Secondly, the entrances are signaled with golden colored skulls, so any player that's remotely interested in exploration should have no problem locating them. The mystery of if a tomb could be nearby is just one more thing Shadow is happy to rob you of. All of these tombs have filler platforming prior to the entrance and after their exit, so those will be ignored. The Underworld Gate was the first instance the player could go off for an optional challenge, and its reward of faster climbing is actually a great long-term benefit to have for the rest of the game. The puzzle with the crate is the main set piece here. What an incredible sight. Will you shut the fuck up when Rome folks is talking? All you do is use the crate to make a pathway to a rotating rope point by pulling this lever. Attach it to the point, then ride it further down the map when you reset its position. With that attachment, it will move too quickly for you to board. That's really it, because the rest is just point A to point B platforming. The Judge's Gaze is about the same amount of puzzle as the Underworld Gate, with less filler. It adds one degree of separation from you just attaching a rope to an object to move it. The goal is to raise ladders, so in order to do so, they must be connected to a fulcrum, which is moved by a separate weight. You can move the fulcrums by hopping on the weights and pulling them down with Anne's fat ass, but it won't stay down unless they're trapped by these clamps. To solve the tomb, you place the clamps in the right spot to catch the weights and ensure the fulcrum is attached to the ladder before you try to set them in place. Once that's accomplished twice, the eh, tomb's over. 
The least reward of quicker health regeneration makes for a good passive benefit to have for the rest of the game on higher difficulties. Having this on normal and lower is really just kicking a dog while it's down. I have to find a way out. The Howling Caves brings back the wolf combat, and they're functionally identical to the Jaguar. They just don't have as much health, and they're also not armored to force attacks from a specific angle. If you thought the combat was all there was to it, I wouldn't blame you. It's honestly more of a shock that the tomb wasn't that lazy. Pressing ahead, we find we must make our way through this fire and brimstone. As impressive as it looks on the surface, complexity-wise, there's still not much going on. Remember in Underworld when you got Thor's hammer and a sizable portion of a stage was centered around crossing a bridge that had collapsed? This tomb is that concept done on a much smaller scale. Lara has to cross the bridge, but parts of it are broken and parts of it are hazardous. This concept has been explored far more thoroughly in a game released 10 years earlier, so let's move on. Ah, the path of battle. Surely this is some form of combat tomb, right? Nah, this is a platforming skill check. A basic concept of what you'll be avoiding is used in the tomb's entrance before showing you the main course. The main course is used with the strongest of quotations. You need to pull the lever on the left and the right to initiate a time challenge. You'll see exactly what you need to avoid along the way to the starting points. Compared to most platforming challenges in her glory days, the two here are pretty lackluster. Just make your way from lever A to lever B, simply accomplish with a little patience before running forward and making the occasional jump. The time limit is what attempts to make this a challenging run, but the allotted time to pull the second lever is pretty generous. Pulling that second lever destroys this marvel of technology made in the past, then Lara will make some basic jumps to hit the reward. This ending section pretty much plays out like any of the filler platforming used in the base game. At least the rewards given are pretty useful. This one gives Lara a 3 arrow quick shot, which will come in handy when her weapons are taken, and when she arbitrarily decides to only use the bow. Temple of the Sun is one of the more solid brain teasers if we go by the scale that all puzzles must be contained to a single room. The light mechanic could have been a concept which would have combined well with the dungeon crawling that the tombs used to be. You could have had this big dungeon through a sizable map to go along with this mechanic. Maybe have Lara need to blast open walls to allow light to hit certain points in the map, requiring her to think about the layout of the tomb and how the light interacts with her immediate area. To align this with the older games, I'd go with a three-story layout which has Lara progress to the top first. Then I'd introduce the light mechanic here, having her use it to open a door at this level. Then I'd lead her to destroying part of the groundwork of the third floor, and from there they can use the mirrors and other reflective material to warp the light from the central point throughout the dungeon. You can have some objects only active when light is hitting it, and use this to expand on other puzzle-solving problems, as is the case in this tomb. As it stands now, it's asking you to think critically about what the light is activating, and how you're going to make it to the other end of the map. Again, one of the more solid puzzles. It's just a shame that the light mechanic will basically be left to rot after this tomb. Unfortunately, this is also the first time a reward isn't as immediately useful to Lara, since it just increases resource quantity gathered from foraging in a game with plentiful resources. The Ancient Aqueduct While contained to a single room, feels a little more fully featured than its contemporaries. Last time we had a puzzle with water, we were merely setting down groundwork for explosive to keep increasing the level. Here we need to alter between levels and decide where we want our section of land to be depending on the next task. To show that you're advancing, enemies will enter for a brief combat stint between major points of progress. The way you use the water wheel with the rope to maneuver the wrap when the level is full is one of those mechanics that probably would have shined in a more fully featured tomb. I've said it before that Lara and her mechanics haven't really changed much between now and the LAU, it's just what the games are deciding to focus on. Between all three of these new games, there have been some real novel uses of the rope attachment mechanic, but it really doesn't get to come into its own. It's mainly just used as a way for Lara to cross some gaps one way or another, or for her to break a wall. Shadow has all the pieces of the puzzle to shine as its own unique third person adventure game, but it just settles for being another cinematic shooter. 
The San Cordoba marks the only other time that breaking a barrier with a cart is used. But our main bit here is the ship trapped between these rocks. It shares the theme of ascension to the top with many other tombs in shadow, but the way it's done is by rotating these sails to make platforms. Really nothing crazy or out of the ordinary here, it's on par with the tombs in Rise. Like most rewards, the gift of holding your breath underwater will come in handy later on, mainly for the filler sections of swimming. The Tree of Life is the more combat-focused tomb in the game. The mechanic used here is the explosive gas, and it's really only used to create a pathway to ascend up the tomb. This is pretty straightforward, and the only thing halting you is the waves of enemies that appear between each section. The most critical thinking comes in at the final platforms and gas leaks, but compared to its more challenging brain teasers, it's a far more straightforward tomb. The reward at least continues the trend of being pretty useful to Lara, allowing her an instant revive near death once. It's overkill on easier difficulties, but it's a pretty handy skill to have around. Hold on. Hold on. Thirsty Gauze is our last non-DLC tomb. It utilizes the water wheel again and the difficulty hinges off one point in the puzzle. You need to open an underwater door, which can be done by attaching a rope from the door's fulcrum to a water wheel. You then activate the wheel long enough for the door to open by moving a running water source onto it. If you leave the running water source on the wheel, the rope snaps. So you just have to pull the running water away after the door opens. If you assume that you have to make it to the door under a time constraint, or that the door will shut without the water wheel actively pulling the door up, you're in for a rough time. Realizing that you can just stop the flow is one of those things that's obvious in hindsight, but I could see it tripping up a decent number of players. The reward is stronger charged arrows, but by this point automatic weapons are on deck, and Lara is past the main part where she'd reap the most benefit. We should be done! We've well, we got seven more DLC tombs, so let's see what folks were paying for. Some of these tombs have some questing tied to it of varying degrees, so we'll wrap up any significant ones with the challenge tomb itself. Simple as it was, I was pretty fond of the Forge of Destiny's use of the explosive gas to progress to the main puzzle room. Shoving these giant platforms around for movement is one of those mechanics that I wish would get expanded on by a more fully featured tomb. Here these platforms are serving as the filler before the main course, but compared to the main game's challenge tomb filler platforming, there's slightly more critical thinking here due to a timing element. Again, the goal of the main tomb is ascension, and it's accomplished by blowing the main platform up with the explosive gas to checkpoints. It'll always attempt to reset itself to a lower position until you hit one of these. To keep pushing upwards, you have to activate multiple gas leaks to chain together explosions. This big ass column would slot nicely as the central mechanic for a dungeon, and you could have Lara venture off into other rooms to activate the gas leaks. As it stands now, it's just one of the more complicated single tomb rooms new Lara has had to traverse. It's certainly not a small one, and you are asked to use the exploding gas platforms higher up. Honestly, compared to the entirety of what's on offer, it's not a bad start for the DLC. The Path of Huracan is a straight point A to point B stint for the majority of the way until the final wind puzzle. Until that point, you're just timing out when you're platforming to the next safe spot. You'll move two stationary barriers, then one that you'll need to move along with. There's also a door which will require some wind force to open, but as long as you secure it to the pole below, then timing this movement with the sail is pretty straightforward. Platforming isn't new Lara's strong suit, and unfortunately, it's part of the focus of this tomb. You're either waiting for wind to pass so it's safe to move, or jumping towards walls to climb on, in which case you're just holding a direction and watching your climb. This is pretty much the same filler platforming the other tombs use, but far, far slower. The LAU had sections like this as well, but it was paced much better due to how much more interactivity was required. Here, Lara's filler traversal was mixed between poles, shimmying, running, climbing, and the grapple. Actions which never span more than a few seconds before you were doing something else. There's nothing here that new Lara couldn't do, but it's these pickaxe walls and the scripting that just slow everything to a crawl. Used in a more open, purely exploratory setting, these would be fine, but these are used nearly as often as the poles Lara would swing on, or the ledges she would spend a few seconds on before making the next jump. Post-tomb, the quest we're on ends in a firefight against the guard at a previous location, and this iteration seems far more willing to swap between the close and long-range weapons. 
This seems to be the case for the whole DLC. The simple act of allowing the guard to swap between AI types more readily means that they're less likely to be cocked by Lara, but this is only true if she hangs around the long range types in close proximity enough for them to make the switch. If she doesn't, then they're still not capable, especially given the space. Still, this is a good start towards addressing the issue. Unfortunately for the DLC, Trinity soldiers still can't swap AI. The arena you encroach upon them is small, and there isn't a source of mud, so they'll fare a bit better than a more stealth-oriented area. There are spots to hide, but honestly, it's just a rise firefight. Prior to this next main tomb, Lara finds a native who blows some PCP in her face. The summary of this is that she trips balls and the main content here is the spectacle. Cause you sure shit ain't gonna die otherwise. No matter how you dress it up, I'm not really going to enjoy walking slowly in a straight line in a new Lara game. You keep doing this shit far too much for me to get into it as much as you'd like. If something like this happened in like a Tomb Raider 2 type landscape after a long stage of non-stop tomb raiding, because after all, you are called the Tomb Raider, a person who opens or steals from ancient tombs in order to obtain valuable items or I'd be way less combative, but this is nearly your whole ass main campaign. Having Lara like finally realize internally that she's a cunt, sometimes used as a slightly less taboo insult for it isn't going to make me ooh and awe at the jingling keys. You destroy everyone you touch. Little cancer, little death. No. I, I, I wouldn't, they're, they're my friends, they're all... Dead or doomed, you know it, feel it. You're a black thumb, Lara, incapable of... Bitch, I know. Believe me. I know, you know, the American people know, the non-American people know. ISIS knows, my dad knows. I'm done searching. I want to be around the living. All right. Shut up! There's a whole tomb we still have to get to. The How of the Monkey Gods. We're going to skip the opening because it's filler platforming and cut to the chase of the main dish. Which is creating platforms via switches and rope to advance to the other side of this chasm. A timing element is introduced with hazards and up until the end they're pretty easy to evade due to the visual and audio cues. Despite how simplistically I'm boiling it down to, it's one of Shadow's better platforming segments. But that's a pretty low bar to clear. With no pickaxe wall in sight, the pacing is much better and you can challenge yourself to bypass the traps on a quicker cycle as opposed to playing it safe. The two checkpoints used are also well placed, not allowing you to screw up at every step of the puzzle. Once again, one of the better segments compared to the lot. Prior to our next main tomb is some more questing. We're going to help out this lovely welfare dependent and help him get some more PCP. Firstly, we'll skip the filler and get to the main firefight with the guard. Their overwhelming response to Lara immediately breaking stealth is something that's missing from the majority of the game. This and the cramped space with Trinity in Mexico were probably the only times when I had to examine my other options. Trinity managed that because the layout was basically Rise of the Tomb Raider, but here the arena is more elaborate. Still an arena, but it's a larger play area with different elevations, hiding places, throwable items, and spots for hit and run tactics. The AI here is also still very willing to swap between long range and short range, so this also works in their benefit to push the guerrilla warfare dynamic. These are all positive changes, and as a result this is one of the best firefights in the game. Unfortunately, once around 6 to 7 of them are KO'd, the space begins to work against the AI. I'm not saying they should always know where Lara is, but they don't properly cover the gaps in their ranks to make logical searching decisions. The weak AI of the ranged attackers is just too much of a net negative to any group, and they need far more tweaking to get these types of sections right. Punch any kind of hole in their ranks and you can pretty much begin cheesing the groups with ease which is likely why Shadow sticks to small arenas for combat. They have to know to some degree that the AI cannot deal with an environment that has a lot of space and cover, so places with conflict are never really allowed to open up. Like, you'll never have a firefight that took place in a space like one of the hub areas that's just too sprawling for these guys to deal with. Pressing onwards towards the next tomb is some filler that actually incorporates some puzzle solving elements, the biggest one being the water wheel room. 
The level of critical thinking they're asking you here is about on par with the challenge tomb, yet it's just facilitating you to a plot point which will lead you to the actual tomb. Of all the filler sections, this is probably one of the ones that's most on par with the LAU. You're doing a miniature room puzzle to get to your next section. The actual tomb itself is honestly shorter and easier than the challenge that led you here. Lara just needs to set a minecart under a weight, then proceed to the goal. The challenge is just noticing the ledge that you can climb towards the back to set the other weight on the balance scale. With that, you can roll the minecart in place with a combined weight of the crate and Anne's fat ass holding up the scale. Next up is Slayer's Gauntlet, and all questing will involve Lara impersonating the Serpent Guard, which adds to the pile of narrative making no sense. Inside one of their ancient tombs, we have a long corridor of firefighting to chase down a man. Any commentary to be made about this progression is repetition, since there's nothing here you haven't seen. Freeing the man and reuniting him with his fugitive brother, who still isn't making a great effort at hiding out, will initiate the next quest portion, where one will be used as leverage to force Lara into giving them the prize out of the next tomb. If he has so much as a scratch on him when I get back, you all die. <laughs> the Slayer's Gauntlet itself leans on the more platforming side of things, so it's one of the weaker DLC tombs. As long as you can aim fast enough and position yourself correctly, there's basically no critical thinking. It's more of a basic skill check. Of course, there are blades. Why would it be as easy as just opening a gate? Cause you're a cunt. Post the tomb, do you think A, we'll have a civil exchange and go about our way? Or B, Varl will murder everyone without remorse? Pause the video and put down in the comments why you're converting to Hinduism and your favorite passage of the Bhagavad Gita. Then call your mom. Our second to last quest involves helping Jonah. We're kind of a jackass and probably owe him one, so we agree. The filler to get to our main tomb first has us skulking about a nearby Trinity camp. It's an opportunity to restock the materials, and there's a few puzzles regarding navigation of the space and pathing. It's a better tier of filler than Shadow usually throws. After not getting stabbed to death by selecting the right door further down in the cavern, we find literally three Trinity soldiers just hanging out. They die, and Lara gets one more crab to add to her collection. We then get warped to a portion of the city post mudslide and platform down to the main tomb. Zip's craving is a good spectacle, but like the last tomb, there's more of an emphasis on Lara's platforming here. She'll hit a switch, climb up to the next base, and continue that cycle until the center column has risen back to its original location. There's more critical thinking than the last tomb due to the use of the rope attachment, but the bulk of this area is around climbing. Nothing is terribly difficult about positioning the scales and clearing the path of fire. It's a linear ascension affair. Tangent. There's an old shooter I played on my Windows 95. Floppy disk. It was a western called Mad Dog McCree. Real actors, very animated with their deaths. It's a rail shooter. And it was pretty enjoyable for how goofy it was. The post section is literally that, but played in real time with a psychopathic murderer and Trinity in fucking Mordor. They die, and we complete the quest. And finally, we have the Mother's Protector. Post-game quest. Dawn of a new day. All the bullshit is settled. And this bitch Abby is still crying for our help. We begin back at church praying for forgiveness for the thousands of murdered men. Then we find a secret passage with more Trinity soldiers up to no good. I love that they're still operational despite three whole games of Anne's bullshit. And this would also mean that even post credits, they're still hunting our ass down. Maybe if we end up rebooting the series again, I'll just assume one of them got lucky and capped her. Good for you, random Trinity drone that kills his murderer. The first firefight with Trinity is a rise situation, which shows them understanding that Trinity and stealth isn't a good mix. We then get a bombastic situation of a Trinity soldier bombarding you with an endless minigun clip as you fight your way through a horde. 
You inevitably kill the man, do some filler platforming, and then make it to the main tomb. This actually brings back the calendar door initially used in the main game, but this time it's only one layer deep. The layout of this tomb is also New Lara's contribution to the St. Francis Folly repeat pile. Folly is a good tomb to mimic, but this iteration is predictably the laziest. The central room here will activate once the other three are completed, but those other rooms are pretty simplistic floor spike puzzles. Honestly, they remind me of some of the quick stuff you could do in Guardian of Light and Temple of Osiris, which are solid games to mimic, but these are pretty brisk and don't require much critical thinking. And compared to the two games which arguably have the most critical thinking in the franchise, that's not a comparison I'd want to invite. The positive about the simplistic layout is that you can easily reference each room when attempting to make your selection for the correct symbol on the door. Past this initial section is the hardest portion of the tomb. And honestly, I was a little shocked that it kept going past the spike traps, but having more to do after a single section is a welcome change. Too bad it's the last tomb in the series thus far. The final segment asks you to place the Shiva statue's hands and legs in the correct slot. The level design has all the cues to steer you to the correct positions, but naturally Lara has to make sure things don't get too difficult. Two new paths. Let's see where they lead. Got it. Right arm and leg in position. Shut up. For those not doing the most optimal statue movements, having to run back and forth between each side of the tomb to operate the levers will pad out the section. But the desire to eliminate that travel time should help push the player towards thinking critically about their next move. Nothing here is terribly difficult, but having more back-to-back -back puzzles definitely puts this up there on the Shadow Tomb roster. And now, we're done. This is the sentence recapping what we learned today by briefly touching on all the points made. Perhaps even making a meaningful callback with some relevant footage. This next sentence is a statement about Lara and what's next for the Tomb Raider franchise. One that made you feel some kind of way about where we are in terms of her future. Maybe you agree with the conclusions I've drawn given the evidence. Maybe you've decided to reconnect with your mom and take the next step towards becoming a guru after reading your Bhagavad Gita. Yes, it's all coming together about as competently as you'd expect from a channel called The Game Statistic. But for whatever reason, here you stand. At the end. Or maybe it's just the beginning. Or maybe it's definitely the end. It's the end.